No? Okay. okay. I'll carry on. Um, can I welcome everybody to this meeting of the... Is that me? Is that, is that me? I think it is. Somebody isn't muted, muted. It's, it's, it's reverberating back. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody needs to mic. There we yeah, are. I think I so. Know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Okay. Can I thank everybody for attending this morning's meeting of the South Wales Police and Crime Panel to be held on Wednesday, 3rd of February, 2021 at 10.30 a.m. Due to government restrictions, this meeting is being held remotely. And can I ask you all to um, turn your cameras off and your microphones off. Uh, and uh, I will leave mine on because I need to see who is actually um, speaking. Uh, because of the purpose of the meeting, I will ask that you keep your questions until after the presentation is made. And in that way, we will be able to cut down the um, um, time that it will take uh, for the presentation to be made. Uh, for those of you that wish to speak, make a comment or ask a question. If you will raise your hand by using the hand button on your screens, I will call you in in the order that they appear. Thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Michael. How are you, Commissioner? OK, carry on. Here we go. Uh, are there any apologies for absence, please? Chair, no apologies for absence have been received. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? Mel. Mel, can you unmute you, yourself, please? Are you on mute? Mr. Mel J, are you on mute? OK. You have your hand up. Do you want to uh, speak? No, I'll come back to you, Mel. Uh, he's shown as if he's on mute. It, it, it does look as if he's on mute. Yeah, definitely. He's on the screen, he's on mute. Yeah, and he's got his hand up as well. I'll come back to you, Mel. Uh, Councillor um, Bowen Thompson, please. Hello, um, I'd just like to declare a personal interest. I'm Chief Exec of Safer Wales, and we receive funding from the Commissioner's Office. Yeah, OK. Thank you for that. I'm not sure if Nell is trying to speak to us. You are? You're on mute, Mel. Chair, can I ask if Mel can't get off mute, that he um, just sends a, it's obviously to do with his uh, yeah. personal interest. If you can just put that in the message box. Um, yeah. uh, I think it's the usual um, a person interested in Mel um, voices. So if you can just put brief details of that, please, Mel, that would be, I'd be grateful. Thank you. OK, thanks for that. Okay. Right, that's fine. OK, uh, I'll move on anyway so that uh, Mel has an opportunity to do that. I'll uh, be moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I have a, a move and a second uh, with regard to the minutes of the Police and Crime Panel, South Wales Police, on Tuesday, the 8th of December, 2020. Happy to move it. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Are there any matters arising from that? No? Okay. That's um, brilliant. Ian. Just for accuracy, can I um, make a couple of suggestions? in respect of item 47 in the last minutes, please. Yeah. Yep, yeah, please do. Um, first bullet point, for accuracy's sake, should be, have you considered using the multi-agency 
public protection arrangements. These should have a capital A there in legislation. Um, the second bullet point um, doesn't make sense as it currently reads. Can I suggest, can the panel have a list of performance measures? I think that was the gist of what I was asking at the last meeting, Chair. I see. So you asking to drop the word how? Yes. Can the panel have a list of performance measures? OK, um, all agreed? Yeah. Yep. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Okay. Item uh, number five. Um, is our police, our community and public consultation results 2021-22 and on that basis I'll bring in the Commissioner but before I do can I thank you Commissioner for the detailed um, information that you sent through for this year I think you responded um, really adequately to the, re um, the request that was made last year for, for more information so I'd like to thank you for that also, um, the panel has agreed that item number six and seven be combined, Commissioner, so that in the interest of brevity, we're not repeating information from one presentation to the other. So I hope you'd be agreeable to that. So can I welcome you to the meeting and um, those that you have brought with you. Uh, and for. The, uh, for the purpose of the meeting, if you could identify yourself, please, and I'll hand over the meeting to you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. Um, uh, firstly, can I say uh, that uh, combining items six and seven does make sense, uh, uh, and I think uh, the presentation uh, will fit with that request from the panel. Um, the uh, uh, presentation is meant to set the context and lead us to uh, the recommendation that is in the uh, report. So uh, thank you for um, uh, framing the uh, uh, the debate in uh, in that way. Um, the um, uh, I'm also grateful to your comments uh, about the public consultation, which of course is a, a requirement uh, on me to uh, consult. Uh, and uh, as I reported last year, uh, quite a bit of work has been done. Uh, by uh, Lee Jones and other members of the of the team um, to enhance the way that consultation to takes takes place and to make it more meaningful. Uh, and um, for that reason, I'd like to invite uh, Lee to give a brief introduction to the um, uh, to the report now and hand over to Lee Jones. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chair uh, Burda. Good morning, panel. Um, thank you. Um, you have already commented on the the actual the full report, which I don't propose to go through in in in, in huge amounts of of detail. I hope this really sets a bit of background in readiness for the presentation that is to come, of which that will also touch on the consultation. As the commissioner has already highlighted, under the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act, the commissioner has a duty to consult with red, residents. Uh, generally, but uh, specifically in relation to setting the police precept level and allocating the police budget. So, as you can see by the the, the report that that goes with the uh, that that is in front of you today for noting, that has been done. Um, as we said in the in the summary, um, the the consultation started on the 10th of, uh, of November and ran for a four week period, closing on Tuesday the 8th of December. Um, we did d devise some information to go out in a precept leaflet as well. Um, as we, we are all aware, um, I think unfortunately, um, certainly our, for the last few couple of years, thanks to members of my team, to Sarah Mahon, um, we have increased the, the engagement with the public. There have been additional challenges this year due to COVID restrictions. So a number of uh, posed face-to-face -face engagement activities uh, where we would actually proactively go to communities was not possible, unfortunately. Um, so uh, primarily or, or almost exclusively, actually, we've we've had to rely on on online consultation, uh, which still was relatively successful in comparison to a few years ago. Um, and the the 
the, the, the summary of what was done and the reach of the survey uh, is, is there within the report. So there were uh, 1,001 respondents in the end. 69% um, of those were willing to pay more uh, each month towards or uh, 40, nearly 47% of those were willing to pay more than two pounds a month. So give you give you an idea of the headlines, which we will come back to in the presentation. We have listed there the top five community concerns, something maybe for your information and consideration. Um, drugs and substance misuse coming out on the top there, uh, followed by speed in dangerous driving, burglary and theft, alcohol related crime and mental health uh, crime and, and antisocial behaviour. So quite a, a broad remit, which I suppose also illustrates the challenge faced by the chief constable and his and his team. Um, there were three policing priorities that were identified through this survey, which is improving policing response to victims of crime, increasing the engagement with children and young people, which is certainly a priority for the commissioner and, and, and the force, and making one on one and other non emergency contact more accessible. Um, the, just for information for, for you as you represent uh, 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 people across South Wales, the highest number of responses this uh, year. Um, came from Swansea, uh, followed closely by Cardiff and Bridgend, uh, with Merthyr Tidwell having the, the, the lowest number of, of responses. So um, the report is there for your information, as the Minister said as well, and, and the Chair kindly said, we, we did try to respond to comments that were made uh, um, previously uh, in response to this report. Uh, so you have the full uh, community engagement report there for you, for, for your information. Uh, again, if there's anything in there for, for future years that you would like included that we could adapt, then please, I would welcome the feedback. Um, but other than that, the report is there for note in chair, uh, and um, I, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you for that, Lee. That was rather... Well, can I say thank you for the brevity? It's excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, as you said, the report has been circulated beforehand, so and it is a report for noting. Um, I have a number of questions on this, or should I say a number of questioners. Uh, Mr. Melchio, have your technological problems eased? Are you ready to come in? I'm yeah, uh, no yes, I can hear you. Fab, I think I was I think I was muted uh, at source by the centre there because I was trying to knock off. Anyway, can I just retrospectively go back? My declaration of interest was, as Simon outlined, in relation to my role as a non-exec uh, non -ex non executive director with Safe and Mouth at Tidville. Um, so just to confirm that. Um, no, I I'll hold back, Chair, with, if I may, on my question. Um, can I ensure my question links into what one of our colleagues, one of our council colleagues, is going to ask? So I'll uh, I'll waive my question at this stage. That's fine. Thank thank, thank you, Mel. Um, Councillor Chanel Jago, please. Jane, I can see your hand. I'm I I will call you in afterwards, but I've got some speakers that had um, indicated earlier, so so I will call you in, Jane. Councillor Chanel Jago. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my concern, similarly to last year, is the level of public response. Um, and I, I appreciate that, you know, it's something that not everybody engages in. However, I would I would have thought with the level of the population we have across South Wales, 0.1% return rate is still very, very poor. And I, you know, I don't think we can safely say it bro it's broadly representative of the wider population. I understand we've had the restraints of COVID this year. However, from my understanding, the consultation was roughly about a month long, four weeks, five weeks, um, which again, I don't think is a, a suitable period for consultation. If you look at the code of practice for public consultations in Wales, the recommendation is that cons public consultations should last at least 12 weeks. This has been proven to enhance the responses and also the response rates. This also allows time for organisations to consult with people that they may represent or work with and before having to draft a collective response. 
And I think that's really pertinent moving forward that we do significantly review the consultation period uh, periods for for this um, consultation because I think we need to do more to ensure that everybody has got the opportunity to um, uh, respond. In terms of the, the demographics of the consultation as well, it does concern me that only 33 young people um, engaged in the survey across the whole of South Wales. So that's people aged between 16 and 24. And I really would like to see, you know, a drive, a, a flood on social media of the consultation, whether we change it to a young people's version of a consultation to, to, to be more interactive. But I, I really think that we need to do a lot more in to engage the communities better across South Wales on such an important matter, because I don't think the level of consultation results um, is proportionate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Lee, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, Th thank you, Councillor. And, and you do make some uh, extremely important and valid points, and I, I appreciate that, and the feedback is, is, is all noted. But also, just um, to reassure you, obviously, we have put significant amount of thought and effort into this, and it has been a real challenge, actually. So, you know, equally for the officers involved, it is very difficult. What I'd like to reassure you and the panel, though, we I couldn't agree more in terms of the broader engagement. Um, it's unfortunate because we, we were looking to be very proactive and actually go out to the communities. What we did do through this is liaise with all of your respective local authorities, uh, comms people in engagement people and with all of our partners as well to ensure um, that we were pushing um, the, the message out as, as much as we could. Um, but obviously we can do more. Uh, I do. I agree with you in terms of a longer period. Some of that, you know, I, I don't want to come across here as making excuses at all, but I think some of it has been um, restricted because of uh, understanding the information that we needed in order to be able to go out to consultation gives you a, a limited period, a window there in which to consult as well. But I will, we will take that on board for, for next year. Equally, uh, we have put more resource into pushing through social media channels. So we have, we have paid for paid promotions, for example, to push it out to various groups and through a number of, of social media channels. Um, the young person aspect is really important to us and actually it's one of the priorities moving forward uh, and jointly with with South Wales Police. We are developing a young voices platform and uh, uh, um, format in order for us to target younger people in particular. So I think you are right in terms of one looking to work closer with younger people. Uh, one that we, we target the social media aspects or, or a survey that that response to information that they want. I am also hoping, uh, councillor, that we will have the opportunity to do more physical community engagement and work with the communities. And I think we, 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 will, we want to think more innovatively there where we will be going um, um, into those communities in areas where um, uh, there are events being held, but also maybe where there are certain um, areas, not just community halls, but things like um, shopping centres or, or schools themselves, where we can directly look to work with younger people, for example, to capture those views uh, uh, um, uh, uh, more adequately. But um, we, it is something we were disappointed ourselves because I can assure you that the team themselves really were hoping we could escalate this even further. Um, sometimes it's quite hard if people don't really understand what we're asking or, or, or have an interest in policing or permission. Um, but I think all of those points I really welcome and we will look to build on. I promise you we, we've got a commitment here. We have put additional resources in and we will look to build build on it. In. Thank you and um, thank you for your feedback. Um, and, and just to say really in terms of the report that has been presented, you know, it, it is absolutely fantastic, but I just I, it's just the, the numbers behind it. Yeah, know? yeah, no, I agree. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Rees, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. On, on a similar vein, and I'm going to speak about particularly about <coughs> Port Talbot, which has been hit quite badly by the COVID, uh, uh, as you will know, over the last month. 
I, I'm I'm absolutely amazed that the percentage of people who were, who were claiming to uh, or you were claiming an increase of more than uh, two pound. Uh, you know, when I when I consider the deprivation in East Port Talbot, I can't speak about other authorities, but the deprivation in East Port Talbot, I'm amazed that those figures are, are, are as high as it is. And I was wondering, can I get the uh, information from you of actually the the people who actually responded? Because I I I I don't believe those figures, quite frankly. And they seem to be well or similar across the whole of the authority. Is this not just an attempt to try to get the 5.5 through that 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 you were proposing? Um, Lee, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, absolutely, in terms of the 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 data behind the the. the, the the responses to the area. Obviously, I'll have to come back to you with with the breakdown uh, uh, on that, other than the headlines which are there. I can reassure you, though, that those those are reflective of um, the participation, the participants from that those various areas. What they said to us. Um, there has been. I can guarantee there's no manipulation of the figures or or an agenda being pushed. It is genuinely. This is the responses that we got. Now, whether councillor that reflects the fact that those who engage with the survey. Uh, maybe it's because they are more interested in it or they feel that they're very supportive of it. We can't say. I think it, it, as in line with the previous councillor's comment, I think what we would like to do, obviously, if we can get a larger cohort of people engaged and responding to us, then, then perhaps we would get a different um, uh, response rate and we might have a different answer. So, you know, we, we certainly, I can categorically say, we certainly, these are the results as as we find them, there is no manipulation, and it's very transparent. They're very there. We can, you know, we have all of the the, the original data uh, and responses that I can ask the guys to quickly in the niche portal. But if you would like us to do a, a more detailed breakdown for you, councillor, we can get we can provide that. That's not a problem. But it, I I I know it will reflect the the headline figures that we've provided. That said, you know, as I said, there may well be if we can increase the respondents, which we hope to do, then they may, you may get different figures. But, you know, um, th there certainly is any, 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 isn't any manipulation from from our side. We, we, they are factual and they, they are they, they do reflect the responses that we have. Well, the percentage, the percentage uh, that you give do, do not reflect how many actually people actually responded to you, and that's not contained in the response. In your report, I'm how, sorry, many people, how many people actually responded to you from Neathport Talbot? All oh, right, sorry, the actual the numbers. Because um, if, if only ten people responded, and you know, you know, and I know from our surveys that we do, then then the number of respondents are, are particularly low. And I just wanted to know how can you come to you know. It, it looks great. Forty six percent. Forty six percent of what? Well, it, it, it's in relation to the overall figure there, but I, I will get you the actual numbers from um, from Neath Portel, but in terms of the number of respondents, as, as we said, the breakdown, we've got the breakdown there of the thousand and one respondents of those thousand and one. I'll get you the number of the number that that of the thousand and one that came from Neath um, yeah. for you. Okay, I only ask because of the amount of deprivation we've got in Neath Port Talbot. Understand, yeah, understand. understand. Happy. Okay, Councillor Rees. Thank you. I've got a number of uh, I've got a number of members now that are indicating to speak. I'm going to call Councillor Cowan first, followed by Councillor Evans, Councillor Richards, and then Councillor Bowen Thompson. Okay, so Councillor Cowan, please. Brilliant. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much for the detail. It's been really great to have a, an overview and the actual kind of detailed breakdown of what the issues were of importance for people across the um, the area. Just a couple of questions, really. Um, and Councillor Jago has, has referred to this already regarding um, young people. In the consultation document, it said that nearly 50 percent of the respondents highlighted how important young people were and the importance to listen to them. But just a handful of young people responded. Um, just a question really and some thoughts for um, years ahead. Did we approach um, colleges and schools? Now I appreciate a lot of them have been shut but they're still operational. 
and groups such as Girl Guiding, St John Wales, um, where they have lots of um, kind of young people and they have like um, Zoom groups where they could even give a collective response or individual responses. I think that might be really helpful. Um, just to touch on what Councillor Jager was said regarding the thousand people responded, it is absolutely tiny. And in respect to the time scale, when we saw that we'd only had um, a very small number of respondents, did we reflect and think about maybe extending it for a few weeks? That may have um, provided um, some additional information. Uh, just two other questions, two other points. Uh, 101, I did smile with 101. Um, how do I say this? 101 is very hit and miss in my experience and opinion and with the community. Um, we use it often just as a logging mechanism um, because we don't often get, you know, the responses which, which we need from them. So I think if we look to improve that, which you've alluded to in the report, I think that would be very beneficial. Um, also, a mention of 25% of people wanted more visible police. I have to say that we've seen a, a massive um, reduction in visible police in the area that I represent and the surrounding areas. I know people move and you know people go to different posts but we're hearing um that a lot of the community officers are being used on response and for other kind of issues which are obviously are important but if they are neighborhood and it's been flagged up as important i think that needs to um be reflected in the report and mr chairman one last final point um and i don't know if this is appropriate but i will say it and if i am saying it out of turn then i apologize but um, I'd just like to put on record my thanks and appreciation to one member of the force, um, PCSO Stephen Westlake. He is a PCSO um, in the Heath and Butch Grove, but he has helped out in the local community. And I have to say that if there's any award or um, certificate or anything that could acknowledge the work that he's done, um, I'd really like you know to offer that pat on the back because he really is an exemplar officer for the force. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, Chair, if it's OK, I'll, I'll, I'll yes, respond please. to a couple of those points. Um, uh, I, I totally uh, agree in terms of we did go out to a huge number of, of, of stakeholders and, and I'm sure again I can confirm, confirm that. We do know, as I explained before, we want to reach out to more young people and we are doing that. For, we've got a designated programme and project that we're working on in terms of young voices where we will look to, to to develop that further and, and within that and that's broader than just the finance consultation we want to continuously through the year actually consult with young people and the community generally which again there are a number of events and we have a engagement um, strategy which I can come back to the panel and explain that as well so I don't think it should be isolated to just the precept consultation I think it's something we need to do and as I say, I can come back and, and explain that in further detail to, to, to you, Chair, if that would be helpful. But I do agree and, I, and thank you for those comments in terms of the young people uh, element. If, if I could just in one sense, though, in terms of context, if, for, for those of you who've been on the panel for some time, will also probably realise that in previous years we've had um, we've had single finger, single figure responses. Um, so I just wanted to put it in context that when I took over this role, we were getting responses under 10. I think we had 20 one year um, when we went. Um, and um, so it, it's still remarkably small, but it's hugely bigger than it was before. And we've got huge steps to take as well. So it is increasingly frustrating because it is a priority for us. And, and, and that is definitely a commitment from us. And even things like I think the British Crime Survey rely on dip sampling and about 600 responses for their surveys. That's uh, that's not an excuse. I'm just trying to put a bit of context around it as well. Um, but I am taking on board. And I agree with everything that uh, you're saying in terms of we will we will attempt to to increase that. And actually, as I said, I think it would probably be useful on a future agenda item if I come back into our engagement strategy and our forward plans. But stakeholders and, and steps that we are putting in place in relation to consultation that's helpful. Um, in relation to the other comments, uh, uh, Councillor Cowan, that you made noted all of those in terms of one on one and neighborhood policing etc i know the commissioner that is a huge both of those areas are huge priorities and i'm sure we'll touch on those when we come through the the presentation of relation to demand um, and in relation to the pcso it's always fantastic to get positive feedback again i think the panel uh, uh, and the commissioner and south of the police are obviously very supportive of pcsos and put a lot of effort into their training and see them as critical to neighborhood policing 
So the Chief Constable is on the call as well. I'm sure the that will that will be noted, and and, and I'm sure we can provide um, some uh, advice in terms of how we, uh, um, uh, the PCF respite can be recognised uh, um, uh, um, um, in the right way. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Councillor Cohen, are you content with that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm content with that. Thank you. I'm pleased that you'll reflect next year on some of the suggestions, such as with the groups and organisations. And I'm really pleased because I have mentioned before about individuals who go above and beyond and offer an exceptional service. And I think it would be nice if you could feedback at a next meeting. Um, you know, what we can do to to note and acknowledge the good work that should be celebrated because there are some amazing people out there. It's all very negative at the moment, you know, generally speaking, but there is exceptional work. So if that can be fed back to Steve, he's been working like a Trojan for the last 10 years. And I just think he just needs to be recognised for the contribution that he's given. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Cowan. I'm sure there are many, many others within the police service that are doing exactly the same. And it's only right, I think, that they do get the recognition that they deserve. Thank you, Councillor Cowan. Councillor Evans, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question in relation to, <clears throat> excuse me, item seven, appendix two, paragraph 5.1, and it's relating to um, recording of crimes under the operational delivery context. Um, I was rather disturbed to read uh, quite recently in the national newspapers regarding some forces in England, one being the Greater Manchester Police, which is the second largest force in the UK, that uh, they had failed to record more than 80,000 crimes in a 12 month. That's one in five. And also there were deep concerns that uh, the cases or a lot of cases were closed without a proper investigation. So I'm looking really for some assurance or reassurance from you that these issues do not exist in South Wales um, because it is a fact that we, we've got, you, you've got a list in this report of all the crimes and the percentages, etc. But are we confident, and this was picked up by the way by the inspectorate, the HMS inspectorate of Constabulary, who gave that particular force two years to sort it out which they failed to do. And it resulted actually in the chief constable resigning. So that's how serious it was. So as far as South Wales Police are concerned, can you tell me this morning that our recording uh, practices are spot on? Thank you. Um, Chair, can I, <coughs> can I come in on that one? <coughs> um, that's a question not on the public consultation, but on the integrity of figures. It's a very important question that uh, Councillor Evans has raised, and it it's actually takes us to something that always bothers me, which is that uh, when one force gets a criticism, it sort of casts uh, a shadow on um, the priests right across England and Wales. And it's very important to be very specific about the performance of South Wales police rather than uh, what may be happening in other places. What I would suggest is that when we come to the presentation, uh, there is an element within, uh, within that about performance um, uh, in which uh, the Chief Constable will be commenting. Uh, and I would suggest that he picks up Councillor Evans's point at that stage, if that's OK. Are you happy with that, Councillor? Yeah, OK, thank you for the indication. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Um, Councillor Richards, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Lee, for your presentation. And, and like other councillors, thank you for being brief because it has given us the opportunity to have more of a debate and questions about it, which I think is, um, is, is, is very valuable. Um, the only point I wanted to make, actually, uh, a couple of points. Um, I think Councillor Cowan has picked up what I wanted to say. When, when you were talking about uh, reaching out to young people, that there are already wheels around. You don't probably have to reinvent it for, for, for the police. There are certainly structures in place that can be well utilised. I know certainly um, from Swansea, our own work with the uh, U United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and many other councils do the same thing 
with making sure that young people have a voice in the in the council. So I think it, it kind of links together with um, what Councillor Jago has said about allowing more time. Um, that the structures are out there. We have um, we have a, a children's commissioner who um, you know contacts young people throughout the length and breadth of Wales, including you know and you know and, and can be done by by, by local authority, but I certainly using the structures that are already in place would probably be very beneficial for 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 the police because th those things are already are, are already there um the other thing that i wanted to mention i've i uh people have been asking about how many people in their area answered uh when i look at page five of your report where you're giving the percentages per local authority I've adopted a very simplistic approach by just moving the decimal point one place to the right uh, and, and coming to the conclusion that there were around 200 people in Swansea, 199.8, let's say 200 people in Swansea, and Councillor Rees about 150 in East Port Talbot. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, that it give, gives a I know it's not entire, you know, not 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 pinpoint accuracy, but it's it's near enough for me. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Richards. Um, I'm not sure if there's a response needed to that. Lee, do you want to say anything? Um, uh, only only to say thank you, thank you, Councillor Richards. I think we're all um, saying the same thing about about engaging with young people and. and, and um, um, yes, we, we are taking on board and those networks we are tapping into and it will be part of the, the process next year. Um, and also your mathematics is is is, is, is pretty close there, uh, Councillor Richards. There were, I just double checked, there were 151 responses in uh, Neath Port Talbot uh, and there was, was around 200 in Swansea. Thank you. There's a, there's a lesson for all of us there in mathematics, I think. Thank you, uh, Councillor Richards. <laughs> Councillor Bowen Thomas, would you like to come in, please? Hi, um, thank you. And Lee, just to note, really, I do recognise from when I first started on this panel, the continuous improvement that you're trying to make in terms of the consultation. And, and um, you know, I won't repeat what other people have said, um, but, you know, in, I was going to comment on the Children's Commission and our local authority partners, but specifically as well, I think there's an opportunity. We've been strengthening community safety and the community safety partnerships, and I think there's a real opportunity there to link in with them in, in relation to co the con improving consultation responses and targeting young people using our youth services, etc. Um, the question I wanted to ask is really about your opinion. We've got the top five priorities identified in terms of the responses and um, and, you know, clearly really important, important ones and certainly ones that echo um, feedback, which I get locally. But I was just wondering about how we've categorised um, domestic abuse and coercive control alongside um, with sexual assault and, and sexual violence. And I'm conscious that they're separated because on police recorded, maybe that's how it is. But within Wales, we've got the Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Act. And I just wonder whether we should be looking at those two areas of work uh, together because separately you've got 20% for domestic abuse and coercive control and 11% of respondents saying sexual violence um, and assault. And I just, so actually when you pull those figures together, it's quite a significant um, concern that uh, our residents are saying. So I'd just like your thoughts on that as to whether we should be looking at it in that way. Th thank you, councillor. And, and actually, you're you're spot on with that. I mean, part of this is so, uh, as you say, um, there are different aspects to the violence against women and girls. It is a huge priority for both the commissioner and and the force. We we appreciate that. And there are dedicated teams into looking and there are dedicated projects. You're well aware, looking at different aspects of of that. So, but equally. We, you know, part of this consultation then is to draw it together and, and where they need that, you know, uh, uh, it, it is useful at times to have it all under one umbrella because it will help focus some of the, the, the work. But I think it is useful uh, also to break it down into uh, uh, areas for focus for targeted work because some of it does require that. I, I'm sure as 
uh, as you are aware and others on the call are, are aware. So, um, but I, I, um, I suppose in a nutshell, I, I'm in agreement with you. And I, I think that's part of doing the consultation then is it doesn't just stay on the shelf. We then take that information and, and look at how, how we can use that both to influence obviously the, the financial setting, but more importantly in this instance, but to work with South Wales Police and with, with our partners, of which we support a number of funding streams in order to address the issue. That, uh, of concern to the public, but also highlight that uh, you know it should be a priority, and and that's certainly built into things like the refresh of the crime plan, which which we brought back to the panel uh, at the last meeting, which hopefully will reassure you that it continues to be a priority for for the commissioner and therefore the work of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bourne Thomas. Um, Councillor Green Thomas, please. Yeah, um, yeah th thank you, Chair. Uh, partly being uh, answered because um, I, I was also puzzled around the uh, page 17 um, on the section 5 uh, responses by local authority area uh, when, yes, we have the uh, figures that can be worked back to the um, 1001 in the first place to obtain uh, an answer per, uh, per authority. But uh, I think the thrust of the original question was also uh, around within those, authority, those authorities, what proportion were supportive or not supportive. I think that was the main, uh, the main point. And th th that could be um, fed back for each uh, area, because we got the overall figure in terms of um, was it 65 percent uh, seemingly to support uh, an increase of some sort. But within each area, we don't know which way those percentages went. If you understand um, what I'm um, what I'm saying, uh, and the other point, uh, we can all get our notepads and uh, notepads out, I suppose, and start working out. Um, uh, the number of respondents against population, uh, because the problem on the immediate glance of a graph like that uh, is you would say, well, oh, look, there's only 4.2% um, from Merthyr Tidwell and 99.8% from Swansea. Of course, the populations are different. Um, it would be nice to know uh, proportionately uh, the response from each area uh, to see if there was more engagement from an area than another. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Lee, is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean uh, th that that really comes down to the the number crunching and the and the stats that we've got. So that of course that is poss that is possible. Um, I guess it, the choices need to be made in terms of not, not making the report too overly complicated, but I welcome that feedback and that's something we can incorporate. It's uh, based on it, trying to work at the, 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 the population in each area, the percentage that way. I understand what, what you're referring to there, councillor. So I've made a note of that. We will look to address that in, in future reports if, if that's possible. If not, obviously, I'll give information, but I can't see that not being, not being possible. Thank you, Lee. Okay, Councillor Thomas. Uh, thank you, that's fine. Okay, that's great. Uh, Councillor Richards, um, do you want to come back or is that, uh, I think the term is a legacy hand? No? Is Councillor Richards with us? Sorry, I was struggling with my machine. Oh. No, that is indeed a legacy, a legacy. Ah, but, okay. uh, no, thank you. That, uh, that's it. Thank you. And and Mr. Mel J, are you are you happy for us to move on? You don't wish to come yeah. back? Yes, I am, Chair. The points I was going to raise have been covered. Thank you. Ah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, from from my point of view, when I looked at the report and I looked at Bridge End, um, 
uh, it was gratifying, I suppose, to notice that everything that had been highlighted as the concerns within the gen were actually the very concerns of people bringing to me. So there is evidence that the survey actually works and is being used within the police plan. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lee. Um, I have no other indications of speakers, so uh, we've been asked to note the report. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Yeah, I'm moving to re we note the report, Chair. Thank you. I'll second it, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Fox. OK, moving on, uh, Commissioner. Uh, it's the budget demand uh, presentation and the precept budget report and medium term financial strategy. We, we put the two together. Thank you for agreeing to that. So I'm going to ask you now to uh, you and your team. I'm inviting you to make the presentation. <coughs> we agree that you won't be interrupted at this point, that all questions that will be asked, uh, people will bear in mind and they will ask at the end of the presentation. So if I can invite you. <clears throat> Can I, Thank you very you, much you, indeed. Before you do, Commissioner, it's very remiss, remiss of me. I've, I've, I haven't actually welcomed the uh, Chief Constable to the meeting, so uh, uh, my, my apologies uh, for that. Um, uh, but uh, I, I hope he's uh, assured that he's most welcome to this meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, uh, thank you for that. It's a, it's a very good reminder because, of course, the panel holds me to account for my uh, stewardship in the role of police and crime commissioner um, and I'm grateful to the chief constable for joining me today because it gives a much better um, uh, uh, and a more authoritative uh, information to the panel uh, that the chief constable is uh, taking part in it. If I just say a couple of things, um, reflecting on that very useful discussion we've just had because it's very much about the views of the public, uh, and the role of the panel in ensuring that those views uh, are heard. Um, uh, one thing I'd like to say is that every year we have a presentation uh, to members of staff, police officers and police staff and volunteers indeed and, and uh, partners. Those have been major events until the last 12 months um, in either Swansea City Hall or, or Cardiff City Hall. Um, we couldn't have that this year, and those are events, of course, that panel members have been invited to attend. Um, so, as uh, the councillor mentioned, uh, you can actually see the recognition that's given to some exceptional uh, people uh, uh, right across the force area. But we did have a virtual uh, set of five presentations uh, for the categories that are normally presented in that way. And the chief constable and his chief officers and members of my team took part in, in that. So uh, I think the point of recognising uh, and telling people that they're valued uh, is fully understood. And even in the year of COVID, when it's been particularly difficult, that has happened. Second thing is, uh, and this reflects on the comments that you just made, uh, Chair, um, I've uh, had engagement with policing in South Wales for well over 50 years now, and there's often been a dissonance between the priorities of the public, the priorities of the local community, and the priorities of the police. Um, I think the uh, thing by a whole variety of measures is that there has been an increasing convergence between what the public uh, uh, want uh, and indeed what the public report to the police and the priorities that are set by the chief constable, but also the priorities that are pursued uh, by police officers at every level uh, within the force and indeed by our PCSOs uh, and staff members. This specific consultation is only one um, within a whole variety of uh, 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 exercises in consultation uh, that we undertake. For me personally, uh, in a normal year, I undertake walkabouts in uh, our different uh, towns. Um, uh, I've visited colleges uh, and schools to meet with young people just the sort of things that we haven't been able to do this year. But this year we have also had a virtual panel, the Young Voices uh, panel that uh, Lee 
uh, referred to, which a few weeks ago uh, I spent, uh, uh, I think it was nearly three hours by the time we uh, we finished with uh, a, a large number of young people right across the force area. None of this is perfect because consultation never can be perfect. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very pleased at the way that uh, Lee uh, and uh, uh, Sarah in particular, have taken it by the scruff of the neck and tried to push the boundaries of consultation. And uh, the comments that have been made by a number of councillors will be uh, very much taken into account. And I would underline as well that we do make use of the consultative processes uh, that the local authorities uh, have. And the, the final introductory point, and I think the Chief Constable will uh, refer to this later, there was a reference to PCSOs. Um, the, uh, there's been an effort to refresh the role of the PCSO as part of not just protecting but enhancing the way that neighbourhood policing takes uh, place. It's something on which both the Chief Constable and myself feel, uh, feel passionate. During the past year, of course, there's been uh, a need for police officers and indeed PCSOs uh, to flex the way that they do things in order to help with the meeting the challenges of COVID-19 and the uh, uh, persuading people to, uh, wherever possible, go along with those uh, uh, requirements that have been set, set down by Welsh Government in order to protect the public, protect the NHS and uh, um, uh, really to tackle what has been an incredibly difficult year for virtually every public service. So it has been an unusual period. And it's against that background that we come today uh, to make a recommendation uh, on the precept uh, to the panel. What you have in front of you uh, is a, a report which runs from page 29 uh, to page 45 uh, in the uh, papers. Uh, there are recommendations which I'll come to at the end of the presentation on page uh, 43. And then, of course, you also have the midterm financial strategy, which is a very detailed document looking forward over the next five years, uh, recognising the financial challenges uh, that we face uh, and uh, trying to give all the um, information that the panel uh, would need in coming to a conclusion on the recommendations. Uh, at this stage, perhaps we could uh, put the um, slides uh, up, Lee. Um, in, in and uh, 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 run through the presentation. Is that possible? The um, the, the first slide is, um, uh, as always, a place name, but it's um, uh, interesting that it was an event uh, in the Tiger Bay Boxing Club uh, in Cardiff, where the Chief Constable and myself, I think. Uh, uh, it's a, a year or so uh, ago. Uh, it's one of the only occasions I intend to get into a boxing ring with the uh, chief constable in a very friendly environment. Um, but uh, it, it represents, if you like, the sort of engagement with local communities uh, that we're involved all the time. Slide two um, is a, a, a reminder. If we could have slide two, Lee. Um, that only in December the panel agreed the police and crime plan uh, for the period 2021 to 2025. And uh, I just want to underline the fact that that's what this is all about. Uh, it's about the police and crime plan, uh, which the Chief Constable uh, and I, in different ways, contribute to and seek to deliver. Um, it, it's one that is ambitious. It protects neighbourhood policing something that the panel has been very keen to uh, focus on at, at, at times. It promotes ex effective partnerships, something I'll come back to. It has to meet the financial challenges. Um, it reflects, and even more so in the period since COVID struck um, just under a year ago, uh, very strong partnership with Welsh Government and very strong partnership with our uh, colleagues in uh, the local authorities, the seven local authorities across South Wales. But it also contains within it uh, as something that is important to the Chief Constable and myself, and that is early intervention and prevention. 
um, reflecting the Peelian principle that the first responsibility of the police is to prevent crime, uh, that success in policing is the absence of crime, not the presence uh, of activity. So that's the background uh, to the uh, the challenges uh, that we're trying to meet financially in bringing the recommendation before you. In the last couple of months, uh, uh, the last couple of meetings, you will uh, recall that we talked about taking the drive program for which the external money ran out last March uh, uh, from uh, uh, Mirtha and uh, RCT and Cardiff, where it's been a considerable success. Uh, Safer Mirtha has led some excellent activity uh, and the figures are really significant. Sexual abuse by high level perpetrators reduced by 88%, physical abuse reduced by 82%. Um, the, uh, the significance of uh, removing some drivers of misery uh, for individuals within domestic settings across South Wales is important. But that, of course, required investment. Uh, and again, it was a, a joint decision between myself and the Chief Constable that we would invest in making sure the dry programme was extended across all seven local authority areas in South Wales. Uh, and although things were delayed uh, during the COVID period, we were successful in uh, getting the uh, uh, the, the new service in place in Swansea and Neath Port Talbot uh, by the autumn uh, and therefore there is consistency across the, the force in seeking uh, to um, uh, bring forward the interventions which stop the crime and some of the demand uh, that is problematic for the, for the police but by stopping the misery and the harm happening. The next slide uh, is uh, another reminder of uh, 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 something that has been significant over a number of years. Uh, women's Pathfinder, when a woman gets involved in crime, uh, very often what happens is that there will be small uh, penalties, a conditional discharge, a fine, uh, and the until the activity escalates, and then you end up with a woman, uh, 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 very often a victim as well as a perpetrator, uh, ending up in prison. Very, very expensive, very damaging, very expensive to the whole of society because of the damage to family. Whereas the approach that we've taken, uh, the investment that we've made in uh, working uh, with women very quickly, asking what is going wrong in their lives and doing something different, has been picked up now uh, in the uh, blueprint, the Women Offenders Blueprint in Wales. But again, uh, we are investing in the work that we undertake in uh, this sort of programme. Uh, the benefit very often is to the prison service by not having somebody ending up in prison. We don't get the return financially for that, but it's the right thing to do. And being the right thing to do, being consistent with the principles of good policing, being pr uh, uh, consistent with the values uh, that I seek to uh, push forward as Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, which is uh, the uh, principles that the Chief Constable seeks to put into practice in operational policing, and indeed which the panel very often is asking us to pursue, that requires investment. Those are just two examples, but they're examples where we've gone beyond uh, what was the standard budgetary requirements of policing in order to have the right effect. In South Wales, both of us, the Chief Constable and myself, undertake groundbreaking work of partnership. It's ambitious. Uh, just that set of logos, and we could have added to them, shows the ambition of the people that we work with to invest in partnership, to invest in prevention, uh, to follow the principles of the Future Generations Act, if you like, by grabbing hold of them and putting them into practice uh, with our partners. Uh, taking the legislation uh, of tackling violence against women and girls and making sure that policing, uh, as well as my team dealing with victims, uh, um, does all that they can to, pre to prevent those har harms happening. But it, it's also essential at every stage, as well as doing these ambitious things about working together, about preventing harm, about reducing offending, about intervening early, uh, there still is a requirement on the police 
uh, to deal with things like crime and exploitation, the drug trafficking, the violence on the streets that are reflected in newspaper reports from our courts every day of the week. Those have to be dealt with every day of the week. And the chief constable has to keep the balance between neighborhood policing, prevention uh, of offending and the prevention of harm and tackling those uh, issues, uh, which he does on a daily basis. And at that point, can I uh, hand over to the chief constable uh, to uh, run through some of the challenges that are faced financially in order to provide the police service uh, that the public in South Wales has a right to expect. Thanks very much, Commissioner. Um, um, hopefully you can hear me, uh, Chair. OK, I, um, I will, in the absence of any feedback to the country, I'll, I'll push on. I'm conscious of our time. Yeah, we can uh, hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Chief Constable. And can I just reiterate my welcome to you at this meeting and congratulate you uh, on, on your appointment recently? It's uh, 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 and thank you for that. I, I um, It's been an odd year, but I'll come on to that in a minute. I, I, I will. Um, I'll probably open with the boxing analogy because because the commission opened with his own that 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 was the first and last time that we got into the ring together, uh, um, literally. But but we've we, we've had we've had a few dust ups uh, and we'll continue to have them because um, you know we don't always agree on everything. The one thing I, I think we are pretty well agreed on is the fact that some of the partnership working we're doing in South Wales is groundbreaking. You know I spend a lot of time with national policing, with chiefs council nationally, and people are looking to us and picking up the phone to us all the time to ask how we are doing things and thinking differently about the way that we deal with people with vulnerability. Uh, the thing the way that we're driving efficiency. But but I, I'm going to paint the operational picture, uh, Chair, um, from my perspective. Others will talk about the, 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 the budget um, and paint that picture to you. But um, this has been an odd year, a year like no other. And you will all have had that experience in, in your respective uh, um, uh, positions. Um, first of all, getting the balance right. What does policing do in policing, healthcare, regulations, global pandemic, restricting people's movements, asking people to pull a mask up over their nose, closing car parks when perhaps they shouldn't have, giving people tickets when perhaps they shouldn't have, not giving people tickets enough and so on, uh, responding to 96% of all house parties reported to us and there are lots of house parties reported to us. So um, it's been it's been a, a, a challenging year. Big strain on resources. So of course what we've tried to do to mitigate a lot of the demands is that we, we, we've opened two control rooms for example because we couldn't afford to have one control room and only one control room that goes down with a big big spread of the virus. We would grind to a halt. So we've had to open two control rooms, it takes more resource. We've had to pull resource, uh, picking up some comments earlier from all parts of the force to help us deal with the coordinating function we've played in response to this global pandemic. What happens behind closed doors and lots of people don't realise is that we're the people who are driving much of the coordinated response to this pandemic and um, because we've got a statutory responsibility under the Civil Contingencies Act to do so. Um, we, 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 we suffer in the same way as others from self-isolation from our staff. Fortunately, because of investments that, that you've helped us with in the past, we've been able to invest in much more flexibility. We've, we've got more laptops than, than ever before. We've got more mobile phone technology, which has meant that people are able to keep us working and, and work from home where appropriate. The workforce has been worried. We've had to respond to, to protests and it's been a daily effort to both respond to people's concerns, but also picking up a point raised earlier, rec recognise people. So every week since I've started as chief, I've spoken to about 60 or 70 people, frontline people online, to find out their perceptions, also to thank them for their efforts and work. I did a Facebook Live yesterday, again, with 1,400 people asking me questions, available to ask me questions about, about how we're responding and, and what we're concerned about moving forward. So that's my opening. I'm going to cover a number of things. In fact, I'm at risk of my summary being longer than my presentation, so I'll move straight into uh, th this first slide, which is um, effectively just tries to paint a bit of a picture about what the years looked like. So crime slowed, crime slows during lockdowns, but what we get during lockdowns is people calling us. So, so between sort of beginning of April and the end of May, in that first lockdown, we were getting 206 calls a day around COVID. So people were phoning us because they were concerned, because they were reporting people who were breaching. And as I say, we're responding to a high percentage of them. Um, and if you look 
if you look at, at later on in the later lockdowns, we're getting about this month, we're getting about 136 calls a day around COVID. Um, crime recovered in the summer. You can see that in the chart uh, and demand recovered. I mean, in fact, some of the days in the summer, we had the highest level of 99 calls we've ever had since records began in South Wales Police. Um, so crime recovered. There was a there was a big, big surge in activity, which makes me hold my breath about what the summer of 2021 is going to look like. If we do start to reopen, it's going to be really, really busy. Um, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so the non-emergency calls. So despite the, the much of the economy, nighttime economy mostly closed for the year, people still turn to us and call us. There's been pressure on the one-on-one -on -one system. We, we, I think we responded really well to that, but I'm always welcome to feedback on, on that experience that the public uh, uh, get on that. Um, but when, we'll come on to some satisfaction levels later and the response we've had. Um, remarkably, remarkably, 909 calls have only returned to 2018 levels, pretty much. So, um, so whilst we've seen a reduction, it's only a reduction going back to 2018. Um, so people are still calling us, I think is the message there. They still need us in a crisis. Um, and the two control rooms have enabled us to keep answering the phone, which has been important. Um, so I've been really worried about these crime types, um, really, really worried about them. Uh, I've been worried about people having confidence to report to us. And I'll come on to that shortly. But I've also been worried um, about the fact that we're really probably seeing a suppressed level of demand. And um, as the economy opens, as people start mixing, as people start talking to each other in a different way, uh, we're likely to see an increase. So our forecast throughout these slides is based on a trajectory that we've seen previously and we've just taken out the effect of the COVID in 2020 because it is just it just doesn't paint a true picture of the likely trajectory of demand. Next one, please. Um, so we've continued to tackle the crimes uh, uh, causing the most harm. Uh, you heard me say this in November. I'll continue to say it. Those people who think that they can deal drugs in, in on our patch, on my patch, are I want to make their life a misery and I'm going to make their operating environment as difficult as I can whilst thinking differently about those people with true addictions who need help. Um, we've been focused on finding drug dealers, so we've increased our detection of the same significantly. Um, so if you look from 2019 onwards, that is proactivity, that is that increase is, is because we're out there looking for people. Um, it's been a really resilient crime type too, so of course people's addictions don't stop during, during an economic lockdown. That economy doesn't go away. It just finds different ways to operate. But we've been good at infiltrating that this year. Um, I'm worried about serious violence in the bottom right hand corner and possession of weapons in, in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, I'm, I mean, we, we've seen a drop partly because we've seen a suppressed economy, nighttime economy, slow, as I've said. Um, I, I, we've invested in proactivity there, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, but but um, I'm worried about about keeping that suppressed as much as I can and, and the proactivity that I need to do that. Next slide, please. Um, th this this slide is really trying to demonstrate that that we're, we're we're constantly trying to tailor our response to be more efficient. So so giving people the response they need um, is an important facet of being more efficient, uh, and a re re that results in can result in fewer deployments because we deal much more at the point of contact. But we're pay paying really close attention to the levels of satisfaction in that regard. And we're seeing there's no degradation in the levels of satisfaction if people are dealt with it at the first point of contact. We've invested in an incident resolution team. Um, that's a team of people whose job it is to really focus on solving problems in the control room. Um, what this isn't, uh, folks, and I'll say this absolutely clearly, this is never a compromise to safety ever. So whilst we might think differently about how we respond to shoplifting in Asda because the, 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 the suspect has gone, and as this job, frankly, is to find the CCTV tape and send it to us. Um, if you if you own if you own a small shop and you need help, we're going to turn up. So uh, so this is no compromise to safety. Next slide, please. So I've been really worried. I talked to you about the crime types I've been worried about, uh, and my message from the start, both as deputy at the first part of the year and then as chief, is um, I've been worried about people's confidence to report. And I've been really worried that we're still sending the message that we're taking action. Pleasingly, we're seeing a real, uh, we've seen a real maintenance of the positive action we're taking. So some of these crime types will have reduced significantly during the, during the year, 10, 15 percent. Yet the level of arrests have held up. Um, so that, that I'm pleased with that. And, I'm, and I think that's a positive, it's a positive response in the organisation to making sure that we're still pursuing 
those offenders who are determined and causing the most harm. Next slide, please. Um, we've, we, we, and we've worked, these are some examples, but there are many more. We've worked really hard to make sure that people know that they can report to us. Uh, uh, we've worked hard to encourage report. We've worked hard with, with partners, uh, third sector organisations, to make sure that, that, that recognising that people are more confined to their home environment, which can be risky for them, that they can reach out to somewhere for help. And I've said it consistently since the day I started, and I'll say it uh, every day thereafter, no doubt. Um, I talked about, sorry, next slide, please. I talked a little about, about proactivity. Um, so during 2019, 2020, we invested in, in proactivity. Um, uh, at the levels of knife crime that we were seeing in some of our hotspot areas in South Wales was, was unacceptable. Um, uh, this needed some good, solid policing response. Um, I put some people on that and those people have delivered for me and I'm really proud of what they've done but I really want to maintain that investment. So some of the, this, this, these numbers are delivered by a team that started off with six, then became 12 some months later. You know, these aren't big numbers of people I've got doing this, but they are all over the business of making that environment difficult and they're, and they're producing some amazing results. Um, next slide, please. So, so I'm going to deal first of all um, with confidence in the data, uh, Council Evans's point about confidence in the data. Um, so two observations I'd make at Council 11 specifically, but also to the to the broad group. The first one is HMIC did an assessment of us. And uh, whilst they, they said that GMP required improvement, they almost gave us an excellent. So the categories are requires improvement, um, inadequate at the bottom, sorry, requires improvement, good and excellent. They nearly gave us an excellent. And the auditors who came to speak to us we're saying we've been looking for a force this good because we really want to be able to say there's a force out there this good. In the end, we fell just short of an excellent. One of the things that we significantly do that others don't do, and we've done it for a while, is that we record a crime at the point of contact. It's called criming at source. So someone phones us, they report something, we record the crime then. We don't wait for 24 hours to try and figure out what might have happened to then not record the crime. We record it. And that means sometimes there's crime left on our books that, that you might look at and think, well, I'm not sure there's been a crime there. But we think on balance, that is a better and a safer assessment of the data, more reliable assessment of the data than not. Um, so so I'm, I'm I'm as confident as I can be that we're in a very different place to Greater great Manchester Police um, uh, specifically. Um, you'll see performance there it speaks for itself. Uh, the important thing to, to, sorry, if you go back, the important thing to uh, remember here is that um, is that this is out of 43 forces. This isn't out of a number of forces who, who have got a similar challenge to us. Fastest growing European capital city, levels of deprivation not seen by a number of forces. Um, they, these, are, these are out of everybody. Um, so if we're the first out of everybody, we're definitely the top in our most similar forces because they've got similar characteristics to us in terms of demands. And, and, and you'll see them listed there. Next, please. Um, Clearly, we're, con we're constantly conscious to understand the victim's experience. Um, so I'm glad to say during 2020, we've maintained and in fact, in some areas, improved satisfaction levels. Uh, I often use this the top figure in my discussions with partners. Um, it, it's hard to talk, talk about the, the, the term satisfaction and domestic abuse and violence in the same context it is. I think what, what this means is that when we've asked victims of domestic abuse and violence, how they feel about their dealings with South Wales Police. They are confident that South Wales Police have dealt with them well. Now, of that 90% of victims, there's, a, there's probably over half, if not two thirds of those victims, didn't get a criminal justice sanction as a result of their contact with us, or the offender didn't rather. So it just shows you that that, that, that is part of what we do. Another part of what we do is protect the vulnerable, engage with other partners to help with that. So, so I'm, I'm I'm pleased with that figure and it, and, and it will always be a priority for me. Next slide, please. Um, so, so this is just a slide to in, illustrate that we're not, we're determined, well, I'm determined not to stand still, to be progressive and to focus on efficiency. So we, we've done a number of things during the year. Uh, we've invested in an incident resolution team. Um, I, I mentioned it on a previous slide. They've, they've resolved 42,000 incidents that otherwise would have resulted in a deployment of police. Uh, the mental health triage team, they, they, that, that is something funded by us. It's not, 
you know, that their mental health nurses fund the bills. We're pushing hard with partners to get funding from them for it. But it, it was so important for us because we've seen an 80 percent reduction in the number of repeat mental health calls and a 21 percent reduction. So a fifth reduction in the number of people we detain in arrest under the Mental Health Act as a result of having these people in the control room. Um, we've improved our vehicle logistics. We saved 10,000 hours of officer time moving vehicles around the force for, for, for repairs and stuff in a, in a different way and approach to that. And, and we've seen a significantly fewer deployments to, to uh, mainly care homes and not exclusively but mainly care homes because we've put a team in place who've been really focused on driving better oversight and management in care homes. And this result, which has resulted in better uh, um, risk management measures uh, and therefore fewer deployments of officers time. If you add that up, and I've been keen in my plan moving forward that we're really good at understanding how we do this, that benefit realization, that's 4.6 million pound of benefit that we've been able to, to derive. Next slide, please. Um, so you, you'll know because we spoke about it last year and you'll have, you'll have spoken about it in the past as well. Um, so the uplift program, uh, um, and, and it's an interesting term, that uplift, and we'll come on to that in a later slide, I think. But the program where we, we've been given an increased number of police officers, uh, which brings its own budgetary pressures. Um, the first year of those, this is where we've put those resources. So I've spoken about some of them right in this presentation, but, but I need more capacity in some of these areas simply to protect the public. Um, I, I need I need to do more with cyber crime and fraud, uh, and I know I get that feedback a lot from 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 the public. Um, I need to do more. I need more trainers if I'm going to train more cops to come in and so on. So this is the first year, and we'll be able to talk to you a bit about about coming years um, uh, in more detail in due course. Uh, I think it's my my uh, penultimate slide next. If you, you'd be glad to know, Chair, if you can move on, please. Um, so I won't dwell on this. Other than to say I came to speak to you in November when you endorsed um, Mr. Michael's decision and recommendation rather to appoint me as chief constable. Um, and, and this is my plan to deliver uh, the commissioner's police and crime plan. Um, and I can sit here and I would talk until it was dark outside uh, on this um, because it is driving everything that, that we do. But the, but the briefest of summaries, I suppose, is I, I do want us to be progressive and to continue to drive efficiency on the organisational side of it. Um, I, I want our people to be safe, um, capable as they can be, uh, particularly frontline supervisors, and as representative as our communities as I can make them. And that is a real important, important aspect to me. Um, operationally, I've already talked about the operating environment for organised criminals. I wanted to make it as difficult as it can be. And I also want to protect those that need us the most and the most vulnerable. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, I'll summarise this by saying I want us to work in partnership to protect people, to prevent harm, to problem solve. And neighbourhood policing is so, so important to me in that. I think it is one of the building blocks that has made this organisation what this organisation is. And, uh, and I'm determined that neighbourhood policing, we do what we can, what we can to protect it. Um, and then the final slide for me, I think, please. Um, and then apologies for the pace at which I've, I've, I've wrapped through this. Uh, this is our latest assessment of the operational threats. And I did wonder, Chair, and, and maybe one for future meetings, whether you, you, you'd value uh, um, having a bit of a rundown of how we go about this threat assessment process. It's called the management of risk in law enforcement. It's quite a sophisticated method. This is our top 10. These are our top 10. Um, and um, some of these crime types take significant investments. So I'll give you a couple of examples while I conclude. Um, in December, we had we had a we had a kidnap. We get kidnaps reported to us um, with reasonable frequency. You you rarely hear about them because the nature of a kidnap is that we don't talk about it because we have to covertly try and find where people are. Um, kidnap in December, 100 people were deployed on that um, between firearms teams, surveillance teams, um, negotiators, investigators, and so on. One event. Um, the murder in, in, in Cardiff on the 29th of January uh, investigation, tragic death of Thomas um, Wager, um, 53 officers engaged in that. Um, so some of these some of these single events take significant resource uh, for us for us to do our best to bring offenders to justice and protect the public. Chair, I shall leave it there. Thank you. Um, at that point, uh, can I thank the Chief Constable for that presentation? Uh, 
thought it was very important that we should answer the uh, the question, uh, which is, what are you doing with our money? Um, and uh, I hope you'd agree with me that it is an impressive um, uh, presentation uh, in terms of a whole set of very difficult issues that are being uh, tackled by the chief constable and his team. But that final point of the key challenges going forward is that um, uh, the neither the chief constable nor individual police officers can rest on their laurels. Uh, there's a new challenge every day. Uh, and that assessment of the challenges going forward, the operational risks, uh, are ones that, uh, uh, frankly, have to keep us all awake at night because uh, it's our job to try to anticipate them and to try to make sure that the force has the capacity to be able to meet um, those challenges that we know are coming down the line uh, and to be able to deal with unpredictable circumstances uh, on a whole series of occasions and all the time to dig deeper into what's happening behind the reports that come to the police, what's happening within our communities, how can we make our communities safer, how can we work with uh, partners to anticipate uh, the things that cause harm to people in our communities and to roll back, if you like, trends where there are negative ones. Uh, it's interesting that in terms of the main operational risk right at the top, you have drug trafficking and supply. Uh, and that reflects, of course, the uh, thing that came back in the opinion survey. And it comes uh, in uh, issues that we discuss as one of the main drivers of harm. The other ones being things like mental health challenges uh, and uh, domestic violence and abuse. So very important things for us to be tackling. And that says the context uh, for us to move on to the budget and say, in order to make sure that we maintain this type uh, of response, that we maintain South Wales as an excellent force, that we maintain South Wales as pushing the boundaries, but also, uh, and going back to the, uh, the point that uh, uh, councillors made earlier, that we know that uh, times are tough for everybody in our communities. We have to get the balance right in coming forward with our budget priorities uh, and in coming to the recommendation, which we'll come to shortly, uh, of the precept level for the coming year. So at that point, can I ask uh, Omar Hussain uh, to pick up the uh, threads and talk to us about the finances? Thank you, Commissioner, and, uh, and good morning, members. Um, what, what I'll talk through is uh, essentially bring you up to date from our presentation to you back in December. And you recall back in December, we were still awaiting the government settlement on, on police funding. And at that stage, we, we were making a certain a number of assumptions for you. One of those was around uh, the core grant and that we were expecting it to be flat cash. Um, and, and that's in reality what, what's, what's transpired and we'll, we'll, we'll break that down more for you as, as the presentation goes on. We also <clears throat> assume that the uplift programme um, for additional officers and staff would be funded and it wouldn't have a negative impact in the immediate year uh, in, in terms of our precept requirements and again that's been proven to be correct. Um, we would also mention the apprenticeship levy and the fact that we make a contribution uh, towards the apprenticeship levy, but also then have additional costs on the police education qualification framework, which is the degree level qualification for police officers going forwards. And we, we said we, we are still awaiting Home Office uh, consideration on that. Uh, that is still outstanding. Uh, but what we have done, though, is we have assumed that we will receive around a million pounds worth of reimbursement directly from the Home Office. And that's one of the budget risks that we are carrying forward. Now, in the past, uh, I've briefed you that we received a million pounds for the last two consecutive years to be shared across all four forces. So our share of that's been around 400,000 pounds, but that was always intended to be an interim measure and a permanent solution was awaited. So uh, uh, the latest update we have for you is we've been optimistic on receiving our full reimbursement particularly on the tuition fees that we pay towards the officer's degree qualification standard. 
Um, we also mentioned unavoidable pay and price increases. Um, those uh, have been affirmed and they've been reflected within the region national strategy. Uh, we also talked about technology and capital funding. So we said that the capital grant had been reduced by 90%. So pre-austerity, it was around 3.1 million pounds and we were anticipating it to be around 300,000 pounds. Unfortunately, that's also been confirmed. So the, 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 the capital grant that we receive is now a, a fraction of what we, what we used to receive. And then the 58 million pounds worth of uh, a recurring now cashable savings, those have been embedded and, and we again uh, will explain a bit more about how we utilize those to reduce the budget requirement. And then just a final point in terms of uh, the introductory point, uh, year on year we've delivered a highly accurate budget to actual spend. And again, despite COVID and the challenges we have this year, we are, we are forecasting a break even position at this stage. So in terms of wiggle room, uh, we are pretty good at forecasting and predicting and, and actually delivering on our priorities and the expenditure that goes with that. OK, next slide, please. So an important question for members and the public, because we are stewards of public money, is do we use that money wisely and what do our uh, external independent assessors say about the, the deliver, deliverability of value for money within, within South Wales Police. And consistently, the HMIC has rated us good in terms of value for money. The Audit Wales's annual assessment of us has also confirmed that we provide good value for money and, and the, there are appropriate arrangements in place for value for money. And then we have the internal audit service, which again is, a, is an independent function, which, which a joint audit committee uh, overseas as part of that process. And again, the Joint Audit Committee was was uh, provided assurance to both the Chief Constable and the Police and Crime Commissioner that we have adequate arrangements in place for value for money. And within the comprehensive medium term financial strategy uh, around appendices three and four, we provide a lot more detail in terms of our value for money. And, and I, we have presented to you previously, um, we've gone beyond this and we've looked at um, actual uh, cashable uh, value for money and how do you how do you translate the police service in terms of uh, value for money and we compared our service in terms of crime per thousand population with our more similar grouping of families by the HMIC and we were able to show you that you were 20 percent less chance of being a victim of crime in South Wales Police compared to our family of forces uh, which are Lancashire, Northumbria, Humberside, South Yorkshire, Gwent and Nottinghamshire so those groupings are determined by the HMIC and when you compare our performance against theirs, uh, we deliver around £650 million worth of less harm on the street because that is what uh, lower crime translates to in terms of uh, public harm and, 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 and then quantifying that in terms of value for money. So confident that we are independently and, in, and individually assessed at delivering value for money. Next slide, please. So this is a breakdown of the 58 million pounds and you'll see we've done big things, not not small items. So reducing our contact centres from seven to one, you can't go below one. And as the chief mentioned, we had to open two. The second one was our, our emergency contact centre. So we have to have a, a backup facility in case something major happens to our facility in HQ. And then on, during the COVID crisis, we've opened up that backup facility. Uh, but in essence, we have one contact centre that's shared with the South and West Fire and Rescue Services and Mid and West Fire and Rescue Services. And we also have a presence within that facility from the, from the ambulance service in terms of the um, mental health triage and, and, and the non-emergency calls as well. We've also rationalised custody from 16 uh, facilities down to four. Uh, we've now reduced uh, basic command units, again, aligned them to our uh, health partners and, and, and public service boards. And so we've effectively have three basic command units now. We have leaned the back office and that's resulted in hundreds of, of police staff posts being reduced. And in essence, we've lost a, over a thousand people in terms of officers, police staff and PCSOs. And we haven't stopped there. The estate is, is a huge, huge ask. And I think trying to rationalize the estate takes a long time, but we have reduced it already by, by a third. And our estate medium term to long term estate strategy talks about rationalizing the buildings further by another 33%. And our fleet has been reduced by 20%. So we do a million less miles in responding to calls because we've invested in asset tracking technology 
And so we've minimised officers responding to calls by identifying the nearest officer to the incident and the best qualified officer to the incident to make sure we respond effectively. So that's been our, our, our kind of uh, efficiency measures. Uh, next slide is just confirming where we are with the uh, grant that the Home Office has affirmed. So as we as this slide shows, um, it shows you the year on year increases investment in the blue bars. Then the red bars are the consecutive reductions in, in police grant funding uh, in terms of core. And then the two yellow bars uh, indicate the uplift grant funding, which is welcomed clearly given the uh, austerity we've gone through the last 10 years. But it then that does bring it with, with some implications, and I'll expand on those implications later on. But as we speak, folks, uh, by the time we get to the end of March 2022, we'll have the same level of cash that we had in 2005 six, 15 years ago. And the, in real terms, if you take inflation into account, we're still policing South Wales with budgeted funding of around 1980s levels. Next slide, please. So as we talked about the implications and austerity, this slide shows the um, what's happened to police officer numbers in particular since 1979. And the blue line shows the South Wales police's uh, movements, uh, and they use the y-axis on the right-hand side. Um, and the red line is the England and Wales's numbers, and they use the, the y-axis on the left-hand side. But the, the kind of takeaways from this slide are, A, you'll see that we were able to predict what was going to happen in terms of austerity many years earlier than the rest of the forces in England and Wales. And as a result of that, we were able to better respond to, to the austerity measures. And also we turned around the reductions a lot quicker. So we we're a couple of years ahead of the trend in terms of movements in funding and the implications for the service. But you'd also see that we've had to reduce officer numbers in 10 years, and now we're expected to grow this roughly the same amount of numbers in three years. So not only do we have to recruit another 425 officers, but also replace around 500 officers who are about to retire in that same intervening period. So it's a considerable ask to recruit nearly a thousand people in that very short space of time. But those are the grant conditions. So if we want to secure the maximum amount of grant um, and, and we are being monitored on a monthly basis, then we are, that's what we have to do. So in terms of assurance for you, uh, we are currently going to end this financial year with 43 officers ahead of schedule. So we were required to recruit 136 officers by the end of March uh, 2021. Uh, we will have it uh, recruited 179. And that is a strategy to make sure that we squeeze every penny out of the uplift grant and claim it back to be used in, 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 in the South West Police area. And that trend will continue. We're expecting to be around 66 officers ahead by the time we get to March 2022. But even if you do achieve all the potential allocations, so, so far the allocations, apart from a uh, about 1,200 officers, I think, which are being retained for central operations, we will get the rest of them allocated on a formula and we believe that our formula share will result in around 425 officers by the time we get to March 2023. And uh, you will know from the previous presentations, we've had to reduce by about 479. So we'll still be around 50 officers short at the end of this process. But importantly, we'll still have the same number of officers back to 2007 uh, when policing in 2021-22 is, is radically different. Um, I'll pause there just just to if, if 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 the chief constable wants to make any comments on on the service and experience loss in those ten years and how long it will take for those additional officers to make an impact. So there's a couple of observations. Thanks, so much. I think um, I think that ten years is is it did drive some efficiencies. It did because we had to uh, we had to respond to to the to the financial challenges that we faced. What, what the uplift doesn't recognise is, is the level of police staff that we've lost during that period too, um, who, who helped to support frontline policing and do lots of jobs that didn't require the powers of an officer. I mean, uh, it, it'll take a while, but I don't think it'll ever be quite the same in any case because the world's a very different place than it was in 2007 and certainly policing uh, feels to be, you know, I'm in my 26th year of policing now and it 
every year it seems to get more complicated because because everything around us seems to get more more complicated so um so i won't say much more than that on that thank you omar thank you chief uh, next slide please so, so members, um, the, the medium term financial strategy contains a huge amount of detail and, and it, it has to because you, want, you need to be assured that we take every factor that we need to take into account to plan effectively going forwards. But what this slide does, does is to summarise succinctly what the settlement is. So uh, the flat, crash, flat cash grant settlement is £161 million, the police uplift funding uh, which is linked to the uh, increase in, in our staff and officer numbers is 22.7 million. And again, if you if you've gone through this through the strategy, we've done a huge amount of work to strip out uplift from core funding. That was to, so a to show you what 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 uplift is funding, but also for us to make sure we were able to attribute as much of the expenditure that we currently have in the system to uplift in line with the grant conditions. So. Just an assurance that we're going to squeeze every penny out of that 22.7 and minimise impact on, on the core grant that we've, we've been given, um, which has contributed towards reducing our overall gap. Uh, the base precept, uh, so say what we signed off with last year is 135.9 million, and the changes in property values, which we did say in December, that we were uncertain around what, us, what the uh, impact of COVID and the economic circumstances will have on the economy and the recovery rates. Uh, five out of the local authorities have shown a positive increase in the property bandings. Two have shown a negative impact. But overall, the net result is around 0.8 million pounds in terms of property banding changes. So our, our standstill funding, if you like, then is 320 million pounds. When we've gone through the detailed budget calculations to balance the books, we need 327.9 million pounds, which leaves us a funding gap of 7.5 million pounds. And again, just as a reminder, had we not had the pay freeze uh, imposed by by this by the government on the settlement for policing, that would have been closer to 12 million pounds. And as, as I've said previously, that's roughly our annual uh, inflationary pressures on, on a standstill budget. So uh, it's only 7.5 because there's been a pay freeze is the is the conclusion we can draw from that. Thank you. Next slide. So I, I won't apologize, apologize for this slide because this slide is consistent and members have seen it frequently and, and we do track our journey throughout uh, the uh, trans, um, austerity years to bring you right up to speed. So um, just to explain again then, so the, the black line is our expenditure. So we come from a balanced position at, at austerity in 2000, before austerity in 2010-11 and then year on year, uh, imposed cost pressures drive our expenditure upwards. Some of those we've selected ourselves. So in the blue box, I've shown examples of what drives that black line upwards. So pay awards, price inflation, changes in national insurance beyond our control, the introduction of the apprenticeship levy, the imposition of police education qualification framework, our, our own investment because we identified early the need to invest in vulnerability, uh, technology is now a fundamental part of delivering policing, less so than it was in 2010 and 11, and predominantly short life assets which need regular replacement. And then pensions, I think every public sector body has experienced increases in pensions and that is going to continue. And then and capital infrastructure, we've had to shift the burden for replacing capital from grants in, into revenue. So that's what drives up the black line. The red line is, is the police grant, and as, as you can see, it's gr reduced gradually year on year. And, and you asked the question, I think, last in, in December, what, what would that have been if we didn't had the austerity cuts and if it had maintained inflationary protection? Well, that would have been £74 million pounds higher. Um, so if you look at where we are in 2021-22, we're seeking an overall 5.5% increase in precept, which will take the aggregate precept to £67 million. Had we had the £74 million police grant protected, that would have, well, you, that would have wiped out the increases in police precept. So that's the, that's the challenge we've had and that's the challenge we've addressed. But importantly, we've shared that burden with the public. So we've identified internally 58 million pounds worth of efficiency savings to achieve a balanced budget. And those, those are recurrent. 
So we've not gone back and, you know, and, and gone back to in increasing expenditure. We've protected those going forwards as part of that process. And we've assumed flat cash going forwards. It's the assumption in the, in the, in the medium term strategy. We don't know there's a comprehensive spending review promised again for this year. It was cancelled last year and the council the year before that. Um, and, and the your Office of Budget Responsibility indicates that the level of government borrowing and the repayment thereof would suggest there is continue, continue to be constraint on public expenditure. So we are being pessimistic in terms of a flat cash settlement going forwards. Next slide, please. Thank you, Chair. I will hand over now to um, uh, the Treasurer, uh, Peter Curran. Thanks, Umar. Um, morning, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll be very, very brief, but I, before I, I come on to the, the specifics of, of, of the precept proposal, which the next slides do, I, I just wanted to um, bring in one or two contextual issues that haven't been raised so far about this year's settlement. And then uh, as the Commissioner's Chief Finance Officer, Treasurer, um, some views on the on the proposed budget as you see it. In terms of context, as Umar has just said, um, this 21-22 was supposed to be the first of a three-year comprehensive spending review, but 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 all uh, as you as you know that was reduced to a one year, and we're hopeful a three-year now will 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 come back uh, in the next round. That will give us three benefits: one, um, a clearer direction of travel in terms of our our recurrent grant settlement. Secondly, in terms of the specific grants we we uh, receive, uh, in particular things like the Violence Prevention Unit, having th three year certainty of funding is much better than one because we, we commission a lot of that money and that results in contracts for staff which need to be renewed annually uh, whilst we still get one year settlements. Um, and then finally, we, 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 we understand that the review of the police funding formula which you know disadvantages South Wales Police will follow once the three-year um, spending review takes place. So that'll be important. Um, secondly, you've heard uh, a lot about Operation Uplift. Just to say, in terms of 21-22, that is year two of a three-year uh, government manifesto to recruit 20,000 extra officers by March 2023. Um, the government has just given us the 21-22 allocation. South Wales Police will receive an additional 133 officers to be recruited in 21-22, and that follows the 136 for 2021, which have been recruited. And then we'll 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 know about the final tranche later on. And just to say, in terms of the money for that recruitment, that is being provided now. So the budget that Umar just showed you that is inclusive of the implications of recruiting the 133 in 21-22. Just three very, very quick comments on the budget um, from my perspective. Um, it is a flat cash settlement, and I think that follows government policy of awarding flat cash and any new money being ring fence for uplift. I think that's clear. Um, the implications for me of successive flat cash settlements, which you'll see in the report, firstly, the strain on, on our capital reserve, which is um, you know, largely due to the low capital allocations means that there's a strain on our ability to finance some of the large capital projects that, that are coming. So we've already started to look at alternative funding, capital funding sources in order to deliver those projects. And no doubt you'll also have noticed that our, our general reserve is slightly low, lower than the recommended SIP for 3% of net realisable expenditure. Now that is a managed risk that certainly I'm happy with. And you'll see from the report that as the finances permit, we will get that level of general reserve contingency back up to the recommended level. I'll um, uh, what he said about investing for efficiency, that's really, really crucial. So despite there being a flat cash settlement on the core uh, business, if you like, it's really pleasing to see that two million is being invested for future efficiencies because that will deliver savings down the line. So those are my general comments. Um, we'll now turn to the specifics of the uh, preset proposal and what that means um, in terms of um, is that um, traditionally we have been 
lower than the other four forces up to uh, 2015-16. We had the lowest precept in Wales. We're now uh, by one, but we remain lower than the average um, in Wales by some uh, two pounds. Now, on the basis that the other three force, the other three commissioners propose increases to the uh, the 15 pound on a band D, we will still be a million pound on average less than the uh, other three forces and cumulatively 191 million. Now the next slide please. This shows the um, percentage of, of dwelling uh, below band Um, announced, but I think this is a um, an interesting slide in terms of the percentage of dwellings across our seven local authorities that for example in Merthyr, eighty seven percent of households are, are in are in um, a b a b or c um, and if we go to the next slide, which follows on from uh, this one. Our, uh, residences um, uh, across the South Wales area and we've sort of totted up those the percentage that come below a band D and you you can see it's 68 percent so although um, uh, although you can although the headline as I said is is always stated in a band D I think it's important to contextualize next slide Sorry, am, am I fr I'm getting a message that I'm freezing. Um, can you hear me? Every now and then, I think most of the words are there, Peter. Um, yes. If you press on, okay. I think. I, I do apologise. This, this is the final <laughs> one, uh, actually. Again, it contextualises exactly what the proposed precept settlement means. So... Um, but I think it's it's really telling to, to to actually say what does that mean for the lower bands in particular band A and band B and you can see the um, the 83 and the 97 pence respectively. I've mentioned <coughs> that 68 percent of our households are below a band D, so bands A to C will pay between 19 and 26 pence a week. Uh, and 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 finally, just to bring it home, you know, 87 percent, for example, of households in Merthyr are below a band D. Um, <clears throat> can I, shall I shall I take over at that point because I think um, Peter's still having problems with the uh, connection. Um, yeah. <clears throat> th this is um, dealing with the uh, recommendation that is before the uh, panel on page forty three, um, uh, looking at the precept for the uh, coming year. Um, the 1.25 increase per month for a band D property um, means a lesser payment for uh, those who were shown in the in the previous slide as being in um, uh, the lower uh, bands. Uh, so it's um, uh, um, 8.83 um, per month for people who are in band A or 0.97 for people in band B and as you'll see, there's a large percentage uh, in uh, the uh, poorer uh, parts of um, uh, South Wales who are in that higher band area. So the full impact does not hit um, everybody across the um, uh, across the whole of the area. Uh, if we go to the next uh, slide, um, then um, this was intended as a reminder of the public consultation. Where as far as all we can uh, do is to reflect those who actually responded to the consultation, there was a high level of understanding of what, uh, how they contribute to policing uh, and a willingness uh, to pay. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Personally, uh, and I'll uh, develop this point in a moment, I don't think that it's right to be shifting the burden of policing from central taxation 
the income tax uh, funds that go to central government onto local uh, taxation, local council tax. But that has happened uh, over the last couple of years and is certainly built in uh, to the decisions that came in the uh, police grant settlement at the end of December. The other point from the public consultation though that I think reflects what we're hearing elsewhere, as I said earlier, is the priorities, drugs and substance misuse, um, speeding and dangerous driving, uh, a challenge for the police, but of course shared with uh, local government and uh, Welsh government. Burglary and theft remain, remains a significant uh, uh, concern. Alcohol-related crime and disorder is something that we're dealing with all the time, and that of course links it very often into uh, domestic violence and abuse, and then the things that are triggered by mental health. Those are all things that we are investing uh, time and effort and money uh, in seeking to tackle uh, uh, through early intervention uh, and prevention. So the public consultation uh, certainly uh, gives messages uh, which are ones that we have heard in a variety of different ways. The next slide um, then uh, I think is worth going back to. Um, the important thing to understand here, this is the uh, uh, impact of central government decisions on police funding. This is the money that comes from central government. The blue lines, as uh, Omar mentioned earlier, showing the way in which uh, police grant was increasing uh, in order to meet demand through a number of years. And then over recent years, significant reductions. The point here is that between 2019-20 uh, uh, and uh, the year which we're about to finish, there was uh, only flat cash in terms of what we already have. So as uh, Omar and Peter have indicated, the cost of the additional officers shown in that yellow band is funded by central government. What they don't do is give us anything towards the additional costs of the officers and staff that we already have. Uh, and therefore, that the, um, uh, the increase that was advertised by central government of 5.6%, I think it was, um, is not an increase on our existing resources, uh, on what we need to protect neighbourhood policing, on what we need to continue doing the things uh, that were outlined by the Chief Constable and myself in the, uh, in the earlier slides. That uh, uh, need to meet those requirements uh, is built into the police grant settlement, but only by building it in to the uh, recommendation made by the policing minister that every police force in England and Wales uh, should increase <coughs> the precept uh, by £15. Pounds. Uh, in our case, that amounts uh, to £1.25 uh, a month on a bandy property, as I say, less in others. Um, and that is the only way that we can get the figures uh, to balance. That is why the recommendation there is that we should increase the precept uh, by that figure that was given Hello. in the police grant settlement. Uh, and uh, right. uh, I then come to the final slide, uh, if I may, Chair, um, uh, which is the question of uh, what is being paid for in these contributions. That takes you back to the police and crime uh, uh, plan uh, which we agreed in uh, December, um, the tasks that the Chief Constable has to carry out to deliver the operational aspects of, uh, uh, of that plan. Uh, and to do that, we have to balance the books. I have a legal obligation to produce uh, a balanced budget uh, going forward. And the conclusion that I've come to, spelt out in detail in the documents that uh, you have in front of you, is that uh, the uh, the increase uh, of the uh, uh, the precept uh, in the way that was built into the calculations uh, in the police grant an uh, announcement is where we have to go, and that therefore is my recommendation to the uh, to the panel. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think that was a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Can I thank you for the time that you've taken? Can I thank your team for the time that they've taken? And can I thank you for taking notice of our request for a certain amount of brevity? It's a complex issue, I understand, and I do understand that you do have to bring back a balanced budget. So I think I need to open this up for debate now. Um, and on that basis, I'm going to ask the panel to indicate if they have any questions or comments, and they can do that by raising, uh, clicking on the button to raise their hands. Okay, Councillor Bowen Thomas, please. Hi, uh, thank you. That was a really um, thorough and detailed uh, presentation and report. Um, I'm. It is really good that we're getting the additional officers, definitely. You know, we, we, we've we had a focus for many years on neighbourhood policing, and this will certainly help contribute toward, towards that. And I am, but I am concerned about that, the additional cost, the infrastructure cost to support them, and um, that you've alluded to. I'm just wonder, wondering, and wonder if you've got, um, if you know um, how much the uh, the additional or the infrastructure cost will be to provide the support to those new officers are, and and how much of the the increase in the precept is, will need to contribute towards that. I know you you talked about it, but I wonder if you've got any figures um, to de demonstrate that, please. It, it, this is this is slightly complicated. In the current year, the uh, infrastructure costs, the the costs of uh, employing and uh, putting in place the new officers with the kit they need is allowed for. That's what that little yellow bar um, uh, contributes. What, we, what, what isn't contributed is what will happen next year. So unless the, uh, pr uh, unless the police grant increases next year, those police officers will go up uh, uh, as they move through. So their salaries will increase. Uh, there'll be questions of replacement kit uh, and so on, and that isn't allowed for. That is going to be the challenge that we have to meet in, in future years. At the moment, the, the big challenge is unless we retain every one of our police officers, um, we don't get the money and we don't get the extras. <clears throat> so you can't drop back. You can't do what we did over a number of years, which was allowed a degree of attrition on uh, police officers or PCSOs uh, in order to create a little bit of headroom. You saw the way that was done uh, in the in the graph that that Omar presented. Can't do that anymore. We have to retain all the staff that we've got, replace those who retire. <clears throat> and this is measured on a, a month by month basis by the Home Office in order to uh, be able to employ the additional officers. So there's no wriggle room whatsoever. Secondly, of course, the first question I get asked uh, if I'm talking to people in the local area, now, Mr. Michael, you're not going to get rid of our PCSO, are you? Um, uh, we heard uh, today people uh, asking for um, uh, an undertaking that the PCSO, that engagement in their local area will continue. Chief Constable and myself are absolutely committed to that. But in order to do that, we have to retain the 400 uh, PCSOs that we have at the moment, with Welsh Government um, uh, uh, actually having given us an uplift in that few years ago and continuing to fund that. So, uh, the, the, and it would be inefficient um, to start moving police officers into jobs that could be done by civilians because you want to use the police officers in the places where their skin, skills can be used. So there's no wriggle room in the budget in the way that in the past we had uh, room for manoeuvre. That's the way that the grant settlement has been decided by uh, by central government, was announced by the, um, uh, by the policing minister. Um, and I think in fairness to him, it's quite clear what the central government was doing and what their expectation was. And they did expect, spell out the expectation that there would be an increase in the precept in order to balance the budget. So in terms of the figures you're, 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 um, you, you're searching for, those aren't there, but they develop over future years. Councillor Thomas. 
Thank you. And um, I think as well, there's that additional cost of providing human resource support, managerial support, all of that as well, that puts an extra burden on, yes. on the police force. Difficult to quantify in absolute terms, uh, but, but that is a, another part of the pressure. You're right. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bowen Thomas. Um, Councillor Cowan. Thank you, and thank you for the report, which I know you mentioned at the start. It's very detailed, and also for the presentations given by um, the officers. It's just a, a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, the first question, really, and I'm sure that's been um, mentioned in passing, but in relation to the COVID fund, um, I know that the Westminster government have given, obviously, um, the Welsh government money um, to deal with COVID situations. And I appreciate that, obviously, there are issues which the police are trying to deal with with COVID. I'd be interesting um, to learn, obviously not now, but on how many kind of COVID calls you've had, the response rates, the arrest rates. And I think that's for another time, but I would be interested to see that and also about the levels of COVID funding you've had specifically. Um, I did a small consultation of my own and uh, the people that I've spoken to, a number of them are concerned with the large proposed increase this year. You're, I'm sure everyone will be aware that lots of people have lost their jobs over the last 12 months and it's been a really tricky time. They're looking at a proposed increase in council tax and obviously in the police precept. And it's often not that people um, can't pay, they're just not able to pay. Um, things are such as like the large scale events, such as music events, festivals, events and things which normally the police support. They obviously haven't gone on during COVID. And as I mentioned before, we're seeing a lot less police on the beat and involved in the communities and things. Um, and we're, we're seeing actually a reduction in the levels of policing in our communities. And I appreciate there's other demands on the service as well. But it's quite a difficult one to sell with such a large proposed increase if we're not seeing you know, the, the levels of policing to um, reflect that increase. So I, I am unlikely to um, to support that proposed level. And I appreciate that um, for us to discuss at a later time during the meeting. But if you could touch on the COVID money and the other points I raised, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Um, firstly, um, central government has provided money to Welsh government uh, for some of its costs and uh, also through the uh, the Home Office and the Department of Health have met some of the uh, COVID costs uh, for, um, uh, for for the police, including South Wales Police. Um, it, as as always with these uh, levels of funding, it's it's impossible to be 100% certain that the additional costs are going to be met 100%. Uh, and we we're nowhere near the end of the uh, COVID-19 period as yet. Um, but um, certainly we have not. Uh, in any way um, uh, uh, looked to build in additional money for that. The uh, money for PPE, for instance, uh, uh, public protection equipment, um, has been a, a matter of discussion between us and uh, the Home Office um, and uh, claims are made on a regular basis in order to meet that. Um, certainly, um, uh, figures for fixed penalty notices and the additional um, uh, engagement uh, as a result of uh, having to enforce the COVID regulations. We will bring forward figures uh, to the next meeting of the um, of the panel. Um, uh, 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 interim figures if the COVID period is not over and then eventually after COVID is over uh, a final report to you. This has fluctuated from time to time because the reaction for the public has varied. Uh, some of the time the public generally have understood how serious the situation is uh, and then there's been relatively good compliance. Other times you have the feeling that people are trying to break out and being over optimistic. And of course, there have been events like um, the uh, uh, the numbers that turned up at places like Ogmore in Swansea and in Cardiff. Uh, on a variety of occasions. Um, the um, the Banwen rave, which absorbed an enormous amount of, uh, of police time, but it, it, it hasn't been uh, uh, consistent and regular, uh, as you could see from the uh, figures in the slide that the Chief Constable showed, indicating uh, where the uh, demands of uh, 
of COVID calls uh, sat on top of the, the other ones. Of course, that's about calls, whereas a lot of police uh, engagement has been day to day out in communities. And I, I, I would um, uh, contest, uh, Councillor, uh, your suggestion that there are fewer police in uh, communities. They may be working in slightly different ways uh, because of the, um, uh, the COVID uh, challenges. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the figures that the Chief Constable showed demonstrated uh, the extent of demand that's being responded to, and we are maintaining and protecting uh, neighbourhood policing in South Wales uh, to a greater extent, I believe, than uh, anywhere else in England and Wales. The Chief Constable may want to comment uh, on that. As far as big events are concerned, you're right that there have been uh, uh, there haven't been the big events during 2020 that we would have in a normal year, but those will return. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the resources that would normally go into that, of course, are the ones that have uh, helped to deal with the additional uh, demands that we've had during uh, 2020. But those big events will return. Uh, Cardiff will continue to be a capital city. Swansea will continue to develop its uh, economy. Um, uh, people will be going back out at, at a point. So, of course, we have to plan for the whole of the coming financial year when hopefully COVID will start to be uh, a matter of our history rather than something that is ever present with us as it is in the, uh, in the present time. I would have preferred the police grant to increase to reflect the increase in costs that we face rather than for us to have to meet some of those costs out of the uh, uh, police and uh, uh, out of the police precept from our local authorities. There is a shift that has happened over the last two years between a burden on central taxpayer and a burden on local taxpayers. I don't agree with that. But it is a fact of life uh, which is built into the uh, to the police grant statement. And in fairness to the policing minister, uh, I don't think from the Treasury he had any option um, than to uh, uh, push that approach in order uh, to make sure that uh, police authorities across England and Wales were able to balance the books. Councillor Cowan, you, you satisfied? Yeah, and no, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I understand, you know, what the commissioner is saying in respect to the big events and things. Um, I would be very, very surprised if there was any big events at this point in time and even maybe this financial year. And maybe, you know, there could be a bid for individual funding. And I, I know that that's not going to deal with, um, you know, the funding gap, which you've mentioned in the presentation, but it was just something to flag up. And I just feel that at this moment in time to increase the council tax this much proposed, and also this is just very difficult for people who have lost their jobs and people are struggling in many ways. And I didn't mean to be rude in respect to the number of police officers that we're seeing. The truth is that we are hearing on the ground that officers are around, some are off with COVID, but they're not in the communities. They're actually dealing with frontline um, policing matters. So we are seeing a reduction in the communities, but maybe not the overall numbers. So I apologise if that was slightly misleading. It wasn't meant to be. No, I, I mean, certainly um, as far as um, decreases in demand and how the, the finances work out, we, we will be very happy to report back to the panel uh, on that. Um, uh, any, um, uh, any, any savings in relation to large events, if, if there's a saving on overtime and things like that, um, uh, would, would be looked at very carefully. But of course, in addition to the savings on overtime, there's the the additional demand that uh, has had to be met in a variety of circumstances over the last year. Um, and and uh, the, the, the problem when you're deciding the precept on a year and a year basis, if you don't get the baseline right, you pay uh, very heavily in the following year. Remember, um, in 2016, mm. uh, uh, David Powis the, um, uh, the 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 rate was uh, uh, was kept. There was no increase in the rate. They're still struggling with the impact of that several years later, and, and in fact, some of our problems date back to uh, years when the um, the rate was artificially kept down, uh, uh, unrealistically, uh, one might say, 
by, by the former police authority. Uh, I can assure you, Councillor Cowan, I'm well aware of the burdens on our um, citizens and my commitment has always been not to increase the precept more than is absolutely necessary in order to deliver the service that is needed to protect our communities. C can I just ask the chief constable to come on, on, on this point of the um, presence of police officers in our communities? Um, so I think one of the things that distinguishes us from many police forces out in England and Wales is, that, is, is the fact that we've, by hook or by crook and by your support, that we've managed to largely protect neighbour policing. But but there's been pressure in the system elsewhere that does draw upon neighbour policing. I, I accept and recognise that, particularly in this period. Um, I, I am thanking people and meeting with people and receiving letters from people all the time about uh, the value that they see in naval police and, and they, how grateful they are to police officers. So, so I, I really want to protect it. I, I can say no more than that. Um, the, the second point I make, if I can, uh, uh, Chair, in respect of uh, events in the economy, um, I, I'm both excited, hopeful, optimistic about there being a big bounce in the economy, I, I, I both in the daytime and in the nighttime. I'm also worried about it from a policing perspective because when we had a mini bounce, I suppose, if you like, in, in the summer, we had some of the highest levels of 999 calls that we've ever had on record. So it, I, I anticipate that as we move through this year, it's going to be as busy as it's been before. Um, and, and if we continue to have protests at the rate we have it, that will draw upon us in a different way. But, but thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Melchior, please, you, you have your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, indeed. We can hear you. Yeah, f fine, Chair. This is this is not so much a question uh, as an observation. Um, and um, you know, as as I've said previously, I I've been on the panel for a number of years, and I followed the journey that Southwards Police has been going on with the Commissioner and the Chief Constable leading the organisation. Uh, and once again, I I'm proud to say that just just looking at the figures that we've had, I mean, Southwards Police year on year, re retains its position in the top tier of forces in the UK, and I'm talking 43 police forces, which we as a panel, and indeed I know the Chief uh, and the Commissioner, and indeed all those involved at an executive level and the rank and file officer are very, very proud of, and of course our support staff. Uh, but of course policing comes at a cost, uh, and the cost is what we've heard today from the Commissioner and the Chief Constable and Umar and Peter, a very complex business, very complex in everything from finances to the, the dynamics that go on on a daily basis, et cetera, et cetera. And if we, my view is this, if we want our South Wales police to be stay at the pinnacle of policing in South Wales, then we we have to play our part. And I'm looking at the stats here and I'm looking at the seeing that, you know, 68% of the people of our communities will not be effective dramatically. Uh, there'll be 32% that, well, obviously, there'll be a cost implication of what, what's it? I think it's 1.25 or something like that. I just think that's my personal view. That is a small cost to pay uh, for having exemplar policing in our community. And the one thing I'd like to say as well is I think the chief mentioned it, the chief constable mentioned, we saw his list of things. I think there were 10 things, the key challenges as we go forward. I think we should take up the chief constable to have that detailed presentation on the management of risks and have that presentation as soon as we can after this meeting today, because we will have a greater understanding as a panel of the significance and the implications of policing just beyond our belief of what policing is traditionally about. It's a complex business chair, and I think we should take up the chief and the commissioners offer of that significant presentation. I, I've given observations and comments, but I just felt better by saying what I just felt. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mel. Um, Councillor Gray, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Chair Commissioner and uh, everyone who's um, taking part of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> my question, obviously, the presentation rolled between uh, a number of areas. My question related actually to um, police time um, to do with courts process. Um, I'm very concerned, obviously, and I'm sure the commissioner is as well, about the number of 
cases held up at the moment and the number of criminal cases that are being held over. Um, and there are big plans apparently to have uh, mass you know, court hearings and to try and you know, have extra courtrooms and try and deal with a backlog. But I'm also aware that that takes police time as well. Um, and I wonder to what extent the lack of going to court has had an impact on on police, the police's work, but also when this when is this backlog going to be cleared and, and to what, ex, what extent that's going to have an impact on on police numbers to be able to be dealing with other cases. Um, clearly, all aspects of the force may well be involved in different cases, um, you know, CID and, and so forth. And um, I, I just was interested to to understand um, whether that's been taken into account when looking at those pressures. You're on mute, sorry, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, this is the first time today, isn't it? Um, thanks very much indeed for that, because it's an excellent question. Um, and it's a very important area of activity. Uh, right at the beginning of uh, the first lockdown, we identified the potential impact that you've just referred to uh, on the police. And I worked with uh, uh, the Deputy Chief Constable, Jenny Gilmer, and um, people in the court service, the Crown Prosecution Service and the Probation Service uh, to stand up a recovery group um, which took steps in Wales, um, which <clears throat> frankly mean that as the Lord Chancellor recognised, we have been ahead of the game compared with the regions of England in reopening courts. <clears throat> That's partly involved um, uh, good cooperation from colleagues in local government, particularly in Cardiff and Swansea, um, it's involved identifying um, other possibilities like uh, the uh, my victims uh, lead has worked very much with the court service uh, to get um, out of court evidence, remote evidence uh, to enable cases involving um, uh, domestic violence and abuse and <coughs> sexual violence to be heard. Uh, because uh, uh, evidence could be given without people having to go to the court building. Um, City Hall in Cardiff, for example, was used with police volunteers, South Wales police volunteers, helping to marshal uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the juries in order for cases to be able to take place. <clears throat> and working with the court service, we were able to identify ways that courts um, the docks could be expanded. For instance, in Newport, which has led to a, a major multi-hander case, uh, as you'll have seen from the papers, going ahead, uh, which is unusual compared to what's been happening across England and Wales. Uh, my point is that we've, uh, if you like, started to try to tackle those issues right at the beginning um, and uh, did so successfully. The Lord Chancellor uh, on a call uh, recently said, um, uh, you seem to be better in uh, in Wales than other places in getting people to work together. Um, well, that that's a tribute not just to um, uh, to the to the police. I think it's a tribute to uh, people in my team. It's a it's a tribute to the uh, the quality of people in the court service in Wales uh, 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 as well. The engagement we've had from the Crown Prosecution Service uh, uh, is is another example. So um, the. Uh, figures that we're hearing of court delays on England and Wales, which I think is what you were referring to, uh, are not being experienced to the same extent in Wales. There is a challenge. It's still going to be difficult, but at least we got ahead of that and put time and effort into uh, trying to find ways uh, like the opening of a, a Nightingale Court, as it's called, in the old West Glamorgan uh, Council building uh, in Swansea. Um, and in fairness to the court service, their reopening of the magistrates' courts uh, across Wales has been exemplary compared to what's happened in England and Wales. So a really good team uh, effort to try to anticipate and do something about those. There's still going to be time catching up, particularly with the significant multi-handers. But as I say, uh, I'm very proud of the way that we've responded and tried to minimise uh, the impact of uh, the, the problems that you were referring to uh, as far as Wales is concerned. Councillor Gray, you, you content? 
Yes, uh, and thank you. It was interesting um, background. It, it was it was also about the um, the amount of police time, as in police officer time, dedicated to court cases if there was going to be a, uh, a run through. So I, I'm I'm reading from your answer that there won't be as big a catch up because of the amount of cases that are going through. But um, but it was that it was that bulk of cases and and the police officer time. Although the other measures, of course, are, are as you yeah. say, multi agency, isn't it? That a lot of things are taking effect. That's um, right. I mean, we, 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 were, we, we could see that coming, but we tried to anticipate it. So you're right. Uh, and what, what happened was there was a considerable investment of uh, police time. I was led by Superintendent Eddie O. Uh, we, we had um, Chief Superintendent Danny Richards um, uh, taking uh, a role on behalf of the Chief Constable in um, uh, sort of opening doors in some of these uh, these buildings uh, and I think there was some really good teamwork in, in Wales uh, because we could see the the, na the nature of the threats that you were referring to so I think it will be less in in Wales than it will be in uh, many of the regions of England I'm not saying it's not going to be a challenge it will be part of the challenge we have to meet as time goes on okay thank you Commissioner um, Councillor Rees uh, would you like the opportunity to ask the question that you put in the chat box. Yes, I think it's a valid question to ask. How much of the precept, what percentage of the precept goes towards the uh, commissioner's office? Uh, office? Um, <clears throat> I'm not good at the arithmetic, but I think it's something like 0.6% of 1%. Um, uh, although I think that's potentially misleading because uh, a lot of the money that comes to me and my team is not to the running of my office. It's to the running of programmes uh, that um, the Chief Constable and I have committed ourselves. That takes us back to the things I talked earlier about the intervening uh, with the perpetrators of, uh, of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the work that we've done uh, that I've just referred to in uh, working to prevent the escalation of problems in in the in the courts. Peter, am I right? It's something like two million pounds, which is about 0.6, isn't it? Absolutely, Commissioner. Um, page 10 of the medium term financial strategy has a, has a full details of the Commissioner's budget. And as the Commissioner's just outlined, it's made up of, of various elements, the, the core running costs, the commissioned work, the partnership work and the externally funded work, um, but it is 0.6 of 1%. The, the increase compared to last year is purely for salary uh, inflation, not the pay freeze, but but the residual 2020 pay award and increments. So that's only a 3.4% uh, increase. So there's no growth in, in the running costs. Um, to answer your question specifically, based on it being 0.6 of 1%, and you'll see the uh, the forecast precept income is 144.2 million for 21-2. That would equate to 890,000. Uh, but but I think the key thing is that is not a real terms growth uh, compared to the previous year. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, I've got I've still got a couple of hands up, so if I may, Councillor Jago, please. Yeah. Um, just some comments, really. Um, in terms, thank you for the presentation. And I, you know, I completely understand the, the pressures that South Wales Police are under and trying to balance the budget and meet the demand of, of local of local people. However, I, I can't seem to draw any reassurance from the public responses. Uh, mainly for me, that's due to the fact that only 42 constituents within the Merthyr Tydfil area actually responded. So there's no reassurance there for me. Obviously, you know, it's been a very difficult year. And in Merthyr Tydfil, we have experienced the highest death rates in the UK due to COVID-19. So it has been a very sad and traumatic time. In terms of moving forward, what concerns me is that uh, a third of a million workers in Wales are currently on furlough, so reduced wages coming to families. Within South Wales, that number equates to 129,600. <coughs> so that's a significant number of our population who are already experiencing loss in terms of their finances coming into the households. 
At the moment, the furlough period is extended up until April 2021. Thereafter, there is a huge risk of a high, high redundancies across the South Wales area, and we're already starting to see those locally um, when the furlough ends. Locally, I can confirm that there has been a significant increase in the number of families in work, so we're talking about in work poverty, um, that have been accessing the likes of food banks and citizens advice bureaus in terms of trying to make ends meet for their households. When we're talking about the people on furlough, these, these majority of these families will have a reduced income, but it won't be, their income won't be low enough to qualify for the benefits under the council tax regime. Therefore, the, any sort of increases will impact them significantly. I don't think that we're in a position where we can share the financial burden with the members of the public this year because so, so many families are struggling so very much due to COVID. Thank you. Um, I, I think all I can say to that councillor, Jago, is that you've made out a very good case for maintaining the contribution to local policing from uh, uh, central government and from the uh, uh, from the taxpayer rather than the council taxpayer. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not able to change that. Uh, what what I have is the uh, the police grant, uh, which, as we showed, has only maintained flat cash, which is effectively a cut as far as our existing resources are concerned. Albeit that they are providing the welcome additional money for the additional police officer uh, numbers. Um, so uh, I wish that uh, I could uh, uh, turn a tap that uh, would uh, force central government to increase the contribution through the police grant from uh, from um, from income tax. I can't. I therefore have to come to the panel with a recommendation um, uh, within the constraints uh, that I have. So I don't disagree with you. In fact, I agree with you. But. Uh, I have to make sure that the police have the resources in order to uh, protect the people of Merthyr Tydfil as much as every other part of uh, the South Wales uh, area. As I did, um, uh, as was indicated in the slides, of course, um, uh, the the uh, the areas where uh, people feel the financial uh, burden most are the areas where people will not be paying the full uh, bandy uh, rate and will therefore be paying a smaller increase than the uh, than than the headline uh, figure that's given with the band uh, D increase. I, um, uh, um, uh, I, I'm not suggesting uh, that uh, Councillor Gray enters uh, a protest at this point, but uh, uh, the uh, the increase for a higher percentage of people in the Vale of Glamorgan, which happens to be where I live as well, um, uh, is 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 just the way that the system um, works. Thank you, Commissioner. Are, are you are you happy, Councillor Jago? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Councillor Graham Thomas, please. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, to continue in the, uh, the theme of, of the last part of the uh, debate, or from the couple of uh, later comments, let, let's let's put to bed first of all, uh, and it is it does help to divert uh, attention. I have to say. Uh, when we get the question, for example, how much of a percentage uh, goes to the Commissioner's um, office. I can remind those who are members of, of local authorities that we get the same question uh, to, to councils. Uh, how much a council has been paid? How much are chief executives uh, being paid? And, and the answer, of course, is that if you were to take out in council terms, every single councillor and every single chief executive and uh, the lower management officers, in comparison to the magnitude of the cuts over the last 10 years uh, from central government, it would be very, very small uh, indeed. So it's the cuts uh, that we need to, uh, to focus on. But in terms of the precept, 
coming to the precept itself. Uh, the perennial uh, question, stroke observation, is how often can you go year after year, increasing the precept over and above the rate of inflation and to a point where it becomes not affordable by those who are making uh, the payments. We've got a slight advantage as far as the police precept is concerned in the proportion of money that you can raise by uh, uh, the, the, the precept, something like around 40% in terms to the, the total budget, whereas with local authorities, for example, is 20% or, or less. So it's um, very much more difficult in that gearing uh, ratio. But uh, yes, we have to have the um, required amount of policing, but to a, a point, we are really shielding people from the level uh, of, of cuts um, when we don't um, implement to the full. It's a hard nosed approach, but the only time you become where the public becomes aware of the cuts is when the service isn't there uh, that they need provided for them. Uh, it's a very difficult one, but thank you, Chair. You raise yeah. some really interesting points there. Um, uh, can I say that I, I've had, um, uh, Councillor Thomas, I've had uh, responsibility in the past for local government finances. I was the chair of uh, finance, uh, which is what the executive member was called in those days uh, for finance for Cardiff City Council. Uh, and uh, I've had responsibility within uh, uh, central government uh, departments as well. So I've, I've seen a variety of different uh, budgetary processes. Uh, the, the biggest difference that I see in the police budget process is the extent to which the people, uh, the key um, uh, 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 people who do the job as police officers and the engagement with the community as PCSOs and the support work uh, take up virtually uh, the whole of the uh, uh, of the budget. Um, uh, the 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 budgeting processes in government departments and in local authorities. Um, whereas it's been really tight and tough in recent years for local authorities, I know that. Um, there, there, there is more, uh, more flex and more variety within the budget. In, in the case of the police, the, uh, the, 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 the biggest resource, and that's the one that, of course, is under pressure this year with the, uh, with the increased numbers coming back into, uh, into place, uh, is, is our people. So, um, the people goes in. Uh, sorry, the money goes primarily into uh, the people and the fixed costs to support those people in doing uh, doing the job. Um, over the last uh, uh, ten years, uh, any fat that there was in other areas um, is long gone. Uh, I, I think a lot of the time we're still looking at where we can trim, but it's uh, it, it's more and more difficult year on year on year. Um, and the final thing I would say, um, it, it, it is the perennial question, as with uh, what is paid to councillors and all the rest of it, of what goes to the commissioner's office. But I would say again, the better question will be how much goes into uh, uh, prevention, uh, early intervention and strategic planning to prevent things happening, bad things happening in the first place. Uh, and of course, that is where the panel has time and time again supported the innovative way in which we have tried to make our communities in South Wales safer uh, through reducing uh, the threats that we take. You, you, but as I say, you raised some very interesting uh, questions, which um, I, I suspect I'd be best to leave uh, to lie on the table with those observations. Yes, th th thank you, Commissioner. Um, at the moment, I have uh, no other indications of questions or comments. So, um, Commissioner, may I take the opportunity to thank you and your team for the time you've taken this morning to present your, your case? I think it's um, a question now of, of you withdrawing from the meeting uh, and us taking our deliberations 
and we will then inform you, uh, Commissioner, when, when we reach a decision and, and we will call you back in. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. And can I thank the members for their uh, well-informed uh, cross-examination? Uh, you know, these aren't easy issues and uh, I, I, I think it's one of the best um, discussions that we've had on the uh, the finances because it's clear that members have given it considerable thought and I thank them for that. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. So if I can invite you now to leave the meeting, as it were, for uh, a certain amount of time and we'll let you know when you can come back in. Okay.